So Glenn, it's a huge pleasure to have you chatting with us today. And I want to just like jump in and uh, to kind of your thinking, uh, which is both radical and practical, a rare, a rare combination. And, and, you know, let me, let me just start by, by saying one of the things that was kind of very interesting for me reading your book, Radical Markets, and looking at some of your videos, is A, I think we share a concern about, you know, declining productivity, about inequality, about the growing polarization uh, uh, in, in our economies and our politics. I think to some extent we share a diagnosis about concentration of power. Uh, what I loved most, though, and is that I think we share a passion for thinking beyond categories. And, you know, as, as the great uh, 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 philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, once said, he said, you know, when, when you're facing extraordinarily new challenges, the biggest challenge of all is escaping your categorical thinking. And, and we've had, you know, plenty of that when we think about left versus right or markets versus firms. So, so thank you for mu so much for really, in your work, for pushing us to get beyond a lot of those categories. Now, let me... Let me try to sum up at least what I took away from the very core of your argument, and then ask you to to to, to kind of expand on this. Because here's what I here's what I what, what I took from your book, that you know your central argument is that prosperity depends very critically on our ability to combine and recombine resources, uh, land, capital, talent, uh, so that we get the the best possible return on those. And that uh, uh, and we and we all know that's true. I mean that's that's why the New York Stock Exchange outperforms every company on the New York Stock Exchange over time because you have this allocational efficiency where it's very easy for people to divest and invest and, 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 and resources tend to flow to where people think they're going to get the best returns. But you're arguing there are all kinds of things uh, in the economy that work against that kind of allocational efficiency, that work against you know, ensuring that every unit of, 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 of capital and talent is earning, you know, its best return, is, is being used in the best possible way. So, so and, and one of the things that you argue stands in the way of that is property rights, uh, and that in some sense, everything needs to be for sale all the time everywhere. I don't know if I've captured that, but that was the foundation. My head was starting to explode. So why don't you take a few minutes, unpack it, and tell us, like, what... Is, is that what you're really saying? And, 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 and uh, you know, g give us an introduction to this idea. Gary, I think I'd start with something even more basic, which is that um, standard economics is focused on uh, a particular set of cases, which are called decreasing returns phenomena. These are ones where there's crowding, where eventually, you know, when there's too many people involved in something, uh, adding more to it, you know, reduces its efficiency. And under circumstances like that, which really come, come back to like, you know, Malthus and, you know, limits to population growth, blah, blah, blah. Um, this, you know, standard market mechanisms that we focus on work well. Um, and of course, that's an important set of circumstances. However, it's not the set of circumstances that lead to great wealth and prosperity and, uh, you know, dramatic improvements in standards of living. The things that lead to those are what you might call exponential technologies, things that are self-reinforcing, compounding, that the more people get involved, the more opportunity they open up. Cities, um, f the, the introduction of factories, um, networks, all of these are cases where we can gain most by network effects by having more people involved in the process. And there just is no argument that anyone's ever made with any success that um, you should expect institutions like standard capitalism to perform well in those circumstances. Um, those, you know, that's not what capitalism is optimized for. That's not what any of the theorems in economics say it should do. Um, and the reason is, is pretty simple. The basic idea is that in capitalism, everyone's supposed to be paid for what they incrementally produce, paid, paid for their product. That's like the idea. Um, and when you have diminishing returns, when, when more people are incrementally producing less, then if you pay everybody out that amount they're incrementally producing, you have some leftover for the firm to take as profits. 
Whereas when you have increasing returns, that doesn't work. If you try to pay everyone out their incremental product, you pay out more than exists. So that whole logic of trying to just compensate everyone for what they're doing doesn't actually work. Now the problem is that rather than trying to solve the real, the big problem, uh, which you know the founders of modern economics, the people in the 19th century, they realized this when they sort of moved past Marxist, uh, you know, uh, labor theory of value, whatever. They realized that there were these two different cases, but they, and they realized that the more important one was these increasing returns things. But they just didn't know what to do with it. They didn't have any answer to the question of like how you allocate resources in that case. And so rather than saying, wow, there's this whole open field of exploration to figure out how the heck do we do that stuff? They instead said, let's focus on the case that we can solve and beat it a thousand times into the ground, even though it's irrelevant. And really what I'm focused on doing is trying to open up that world and say, no, we can treat the way we organize ourselves the way that we treat technologies. They can be things that we just dramatically advance in. You know, like we're not even close to like the Pareto frontier or whatever, to the best possible organization. We're just scratching the surface of humans' capacity to organize themselves at scale. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly believe that. But let me, uh, let me just tell you what I heard and then ask you a question. I mean, clearly, what you see in cities are great examples. But what you're saying is where you see these exponential effects, I think two things are true. First of all, you have network effects or positive feedback effects. So, you know, good, good becomes even better over time. The smartest people want to be around other smart people. They migrate to cities and these do. So you increase the number of combinational possibilities and therefore the value of the network, number one. Uh, and number two, these are situations where you basically have zero variable costs. So by making more of something and sharing it, you don't reduce it for anybody else. Uh, there may have been a lot of fixed costs. Unfortunately, th those conditions also tend to produce monopolies. Cities are monopolies. Cities monopolize talent for thousands of years. They 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 pull talent out of out of the the countryside and so on and so on and impoverish the countryside. And of course, where you see this now with modern technology, whether it's Uber, whether it's you know whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook, or so on, you end up with these very powerful monopolies. So I understand those dynamics, and they present a lot of interesting challenges. It's interesting to me then that in your book, what you start with is what I would have regarded as the least, you know, as, as the most sedentary, uh, least exponential asset of all, which is land. So help me, help me square that up. Yeah, well, land is the original exponential asset um, because it's the foundation of the city, right? So uh, Henry George tells a wonderful story, a parable of a savanna where there's just an open savanna and you, know, you could settle anywhere. Everywhere's as good as everywhere else. It's all very nice places to farm. And a settler comes along and just randomly chooses some spot. But then once, you know, there, that family has settled there, the next family says, well, where am I going to settle? I might as well settle next to this guy because at least then I'll have someone to talk to, someone to divide labor with, etc." And then the next people come and the next people and the next people. And then this guy who... You know, he could have chosen anywhere. Uh, this family could have just, there, there, there was nothing to it. They just happened to be first. Ends up having, you know, owning 10 square blocks of New York City or whatever, you know, or, or of St. Louis. And uh, through no effort of their own, they become incredibly wealthy. And not only do they become incredibly wealthy, but they can then stand in the way of development, of entrepreneurship, of the opportunity of the city to grow, to build infrastructure, etc. Um, and so land um, is the original substrate for these types of, it, it's, it's that sense of closeness. But of course, there are now other substrates for it as well. But, uh, but I think, you know, the city and, and the land in it is the, is the original one. So if we think about land as this, you know, resource that is often not put to the best use, and you're saying, you know, somebody could buy it and just sit on it and uh, hoard it in a way. Um, but you could also argue that maybe I bought that land in New York before it was New York. I had some sense it might become that one day. And I took this risk and I sat on that property for a long time. I could have deployed that capital elsewhere. I mean, it kind of makes it sound like 
you know, this is just a completely free ride for anybody who invests in something that's not immediately put put to, to a best use. You know, I was I was thinking about, I don't know, it's Ted Turner. Who are these people who own thousands and thousands of acres in Montana? And I'm so grateful they're keeping them open and pristine and whatever. But I was struggling with what would it mean to say, as, as I think is the argument in the book, what would it mean to say that anybody ought to be able to buy that property at any time uh, and and develop it in some way? So I, I struggle with, I guess, those two things. Is it, is, it, is it necessarily I'm a free rider if I took a risk, brought property, and haven't chosen to develop it yet? And the flip side of it is, if everything is for, for, forever for sale to, to the highest and best use as a way of increasing its allocation of, you know, increasing allocation of efficiency, how do we as a society put some limits on how we want, how we want property to be used? So I'm, I'm sure you've heard those questions before, so, but let me throw them out. No, they're, they're great ones. Um, so the first thing to note is that the speculative, like the notion that um, I knew that this was going to be big before anyone else and, you know, don't I deserve some reward for that is not actually, for example, in the case of land, an argument for why we'd want you to get any reward for having had that insight. Like just being right about something without taking an action on the basis of that, that actually helps the good thing come into existence is not very useful, right? So like take the example of the land. If you just buy up that land, yeah, you might've known before anyone else that it was gonna go up in value. But at some level, who cares? Like what, what, why is it relevant that you, you know, you bought that land relative? I mean, now if you, build something that's useful to you, whatever, that has some relevance, right? But but just being smarter than anyone else it is just a, like, a, you know, macho contest. It's not actually something that generates value. So you're, try, you're trying to dissuade kind of sheer luck or maybe even a certain amount of foresight in favor of somebody who's doing something productive to increase the value of that asset. In the blockchain world, they, there's a little cute name for this. So there was there was some like Twitter exchange where someone said, um, like, I don't care if you guys are selling, I'm HODLing, I'm hodling. He just misspelled it. So he meant to say I'm holding. But then it became this thing that everyone said, I'm ho at ho hodling, right? But but you know people in the Bitcoin in the Ethereum community responded no I'm biddling so like the thing that matters is building not holding right and and we should reward building we shouldn't reward uh, speculation now though it may be impossible to separate those that's a question you know can we separate those and and that's what we you know try to do in some of this work is find ways to separate those but but in, as a matter of principle we as a society should reward building, not holding. Yeah, I think I do think that makes sense. Now, help me help me take that idea farther. So um, if you move from land, and by the way, I think, I mean, this idea has been a long, around for a long time. I think people have struggled to, to, you know, to put it into effect and do it at scale. And I, I you know, maybe you want to comment on that a little bit. I'm, there, there, I'm sure there's some political things behind it because the argument is that every piece of land, I should be paying kind of the value of that, of my plot of ground, uh, you know, every year in taxes. Uh, and if I put improvements on it, well, then I can keep the value of those improvements. But, but in a way, um, I shouldn't be able to extract any, you know, any, any value just for the value of the land as, as it is. How does that, I mean, first of all, has that been done at scale anywhere? And then I would say, how do you take that idea and move it beyond land? Yeah. So a couple things about that. First of all, um, it's important to say, and, and we'll get to this in the part of moving beyond land, um, that the land tax idea itself has become a real focus for people, a real obsession but it, it has some real limitations. Like it's the beginning of an interesting conversation, but it's not as it's often treated, some sort of religious solution to, to everything. Um, second, it has been implemented. It's been implemented at scale and it's been implemented at scale in the places in the world that I think have been the most successful of anywhere in the world in A, promoting economic prosperity, B, achieving political comedy across usual dividing lines, and uh, C, in adapting to some of the challenges we faced 
in recent years more effectively than anywhere else. So the three most uh, impressive examples are Singapore, uh, Taiwan, and Estonia. So maybe maybe um, start with Taiwan, if you don't mind, yeah. uh, because I was really taken by that example in the story. So yeah, that, that would be good to go deeper there. So, so Taiwan uh, was, you know, modern Taiwan was founded by the retreating armies of the nationalist Chinese um, who had represented the original Chinese revolution in, you know, during the First World War type period, um, which was founded by Sun Yat-sen. And so Yat-sen was uh, uh, the um, father of, uh, you know, Chinese nationalism, but he was a follower of Henry George. Like he looked to George the way that, you know, Mao looked to Marx. Um, and as such, uh, written into Taiwanese constitution is the notion that the land belongs to the people in common and that taxes should be arranged so as to extract the value of the land for the for the public and and that's been a core part of you know development in taiwan and the dynamism that's allowed uh, uh so much entrepreneurship and so much growth uh in taiwan can you just say a moment about how that actually works in practice glenn well the in taiwan you have to self-assess the value of your property and you pay a tax on that self-assessed value and the government can take the property from you at that self-assessed value at any time so if you price it too low, the government has the right to buy it out from you. And, and how often does that happen? And what it does happen, what does the government do with it? Not, not frequently enough. And that's one reason why in the book we advocate an even more aggressive system where private individuals can also engage in takings. Mm -hmm. And, but, and yeah. so what, as, as, as you see it, or, or as Henry George envisioned it, what does the benefit of that? Well, I think in Singapore, you see it even more fully executed which is that they have a similar sort of a system, but the takings are much more frequent. Um, and the government frequent, like, I think the land turnover rate through some form of eminent domain there is like once every five years for an average lot or something like that. And that's allowed the city to be incredibly dynamic because as new enterprises come in, as new possible uses for parts of the city come in, it's constantly possible for them to recycle land that was best suited to one use during one technological stage to another use in another technological stage. And I know in your book, you know, and, and we're not going to do it justice in our conversation in here. In, in your book, you have a quite a deep and quite a subtle argument about how you balance the need for somebody to have enough confidence that they're going to invest in this in this piece of land and make it better. But at the same time, you know, if, if at some point that land is no longer being put to its best use, you know, somebody can buy it and repurpose it. And there's there's a tension there, obviously, that you that you you talk about, uh, 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 you know, in, in the book. Let me let's go, though, beyond land for a moment, because I'm thinking today and <laughs> it's hardly a new insight. Gary, before we go in there, let me just make yeah. one comment, which is to yeah, say, please. I, I think there's a subtlety that's also not reflected in the book that that even applies to land, which is that. In the book, it was very much like anyone can buy it. The money goes to some undefined global revenue pool. And I think one of the biggest things that's missed beyond going beyond the land issue is that really that's just the start of the conversation because, you know, the usual argument is, well, land doesn't, you know, it doesn't belong to land. It's, you know, the city, like it's, it's all the stuff that's created by people in the city. But then you say, well, actually, most of the value of New York City comes from the fact that it's the main city in the United States. So should the money go to the city of New York? Should it go to the state of New York? Should it go to the United States in general? Should it go to the world because it's the center of global? Co you know, you think of Singapore, it's like everyone's like Singapore so great. Well, it's true. But it's like also on the Strait of Malacca, which is the choke point for global commerce, especially between the U.S. and China. And it's like if the whole U.S. China thing had never happened, there's no way Singapore would be in the position that it's in. Right. So, so the whole, you see what I mean? Like the whole perspective is, um, it's really just the start of a conversation of where that value actually accrues. It's, it's, it's just noting that that's a case where it's particularly clear that it doesn't mostly accrue to the individual owner, but it doesn't actually say positively where it does accrue. And, um, and, 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 you know, once you realize that, you realize that actually land is really just a reductio ad absurdum illustrating a broader point rather than actually being the thing itself. You know what I mean? 
So let, so let's not get let's let's leave land behind then for a moment. Not get hung hung up there. Although it is a very interesting, and I I urge anyone that's interested like dive into the book, understand this, read a bit of Henry George. It's important to understand the, the thing behind this. But obviously today, Glenn, in our world, you know, most of the value of property is is are not real assets. You know, it's algorithms, it's brands, it's intellectual property, it's it's patents, and so on. So you know, how would you and 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 of course we see these powerful monopolies that kind of you know have 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 deep patent reservoirs, have 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 all these customer relationships, have all the stickiness of 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 you know the the the, the social media connections, have all the network effects. How do you think about you know how does how does your idea of radical markets start to apply uh, where where the asset is not capital but something else? Well, I, first of all, there's quite a few. So first of all, it's important to understand that despite all the immateriality of our modern economy, land is still a very very large chunk of all value, uh, and actually it hasn't substantially declined in recent years. Um, we've seen a huge run up in land value. So there's, there's constant predictions that we're going to like dematerialize into cyberspace and people will be scattered around everywhere. And yet more and more opportunity, maybe until the pandemic, maybe the pandemic will change it, but more and more opportunity has actually been concentrated in a few places with very problematic land policy. So I wouldn't discount the land issue, uh, uh, on its own. But uh, in many ways, I focus much more on the other issues. That's why I'm in a tech company. That's why I'm very much in the blockchain space. And there's a whole range of types of digital and intellectual assets to which the ideas can directly be applied. They can be directly used to, for intellectual property. They can be directly used for spectrum, which is another land-like right, but which is very relevant uh, in the digital space. They can directly be used for cloud instances. Uh, which is another, you know, important asset uh, at the moment. Um, but then, you know, you start to get into domains where their relevance is more complex. So you think about something like data. I don't think the idea, these ideas in particular are directly relevant to data. And the reason is that data are, natu are naturally properties of social interactions rather than of a um, piece of, uh, property or something like, you know, some, some, some asset, uh, date, like my mother's date of birth is also my mother's date of birth. So those, that data is a property of, of how we stand in relationship to each other. It's not a property of, of some external object. Right. And, um, governance there, you know, just as in this other case depends on recognizing sort of the fundamentally social nature of the value creation. Um, but it needs to sort of be baked into the, you know, governance of, of the use of it rather than just how the value accrues and, and how, how one's able to take the asset or something like that. So what, so then, I mean, I know one of your recommendations and it's something that I raised, oh, I don't know, a decade ago when, when it first became clear that our data was being used uh, to create economic value. And I wondered like why there wasn't an intermediary that would hold our data in some kind of a vault and we could monetize it and sell it and so on. But of course, by the time I had that insight, Google is 10 years old and like there's no way back. So, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, you kind of point out in the book is how concentrated power is in most of these industries. And indeed, you know, you could argue that the goal of every capitalist is to create a monopoly. And, and whether that was, you know, oil or railroads or automobiles or telecommunications or social media or software and, and you know, and, and often, you know, capitalists have been very good at doing that. And then the government sets in. So is there anything, and, and now we have probably more industrial concentration than, than we've had in 100 years, uh, immensely powerful corporations with enormous political influence. So what in your proposals, Glenn, would help us kind of deal with that and, and, and you know, kind of resist? Because what I sense in your writing, and, and I would agree with, is this kind of strong decentralist ideology that, you know, centralized power and decision making, central planning is often not good, uh, crony capitalism is not good. What in the way you think about radical markets might help to unwind that at a macro level 
And then maybe we can dive inside individual organizations and think about the application there. But I'm thinking right now at the macro level where we have more concentrated power than we've had in a century, are there some ideas here that might give us a new way of thinking about how to deal with that? Well, fundamentally, I think that the understanding of the last several hundred years and what's led to progress in you know, our political economic system is, is missing some really, really important elements. Um, what really happened is not, quote, the unleashing of capitalism in the Manchesterian, uh, you know, rugged individualist sense of, of capitalism. Instead, what has actually happened is a, to the extent that we've succeeded, is a continuous process of encouraging through often multi-sectoral efforts involving universities, governments, and business, the creation of new places for us to interact, new, new ways for us to have economic systems. And then often those are, because of the capitalist features of the system, monopolized. But then there's usually some, again, multi-sectoral process of turning those monopolies into things that are democratically accountable to the participants. And only then is the value coming from that able to actually spread and lead to widespread growth. So you see that with um, really the birth of industrialism. Uh, where does it come from? Well, you know, you've got people leaving the countryside, coming into cities, and initially, those cities are, you know, more or less some kind of feudal fiefdom of some lord. But that doesn't really work well, because the lord then extracts all the rents and, you know, stagnates progress and whatever. So then the cities become republics, you know, that are governed by their members. And then they're able to grow, you know, and then they're able to provide sewage and, and blah, blah, blah. And so then you, you have now the emergence of, like, factories, and initially, these factories are just, you know, pure capitalist enterprises. But pretty quickly, you realize, well, then the capitalist, like, treats everyone like a machine. People aren't actually able to be creative. They aren't able to have agency. They aren't able to advance in their careers. They're kind of like slaves. And that's actually not productive, right? And so then labor unions emerge uh, to allow for that input, for that creative response that actually makes those uh, sites of, of real, you know, industrial progress. And uh, you've got similar things that happen with utilities and with et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think that we've, we've sort of told ourselves the wrong story about the past. And as such, we see the path to the future incorrectly as well. Um, it, it is in the nature of, you know, simplistic capitalism to lead to these types of hierarchical monopolies, uh, which are actually themselves opposed to the spirit that capitalism imagines itself as having. Um, and it's only by constantly having these other forces play a role in bringing about and emerging new forms of sort of democratization that we actually allow markets to thrive within the system that, that throws up these, these monopolies. And, you know, the Internet's the perfect example of this. Like, you know, everyone thinks of the Internet as like, oh my gosh, the internet allows, you know, the world to be flat and capital, you know, blah, 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 and John Perry Barlow anarchism, blah, blah, blah. But actually the internet only emerged from a concerted set of efforts by governments, universities, and businesses to sort of overcome their differences and create an even playing field, which allowed for that kind of decentralization, even if for just a very short period of time to emerge. And it's by forgetting those origin stories, forgetting the active democratic engagement that it takes to create decentralization, that we constantly allow decentralizing technologies to fall into centralization again. Yeah, and I think, I think you're right. We, we end up, and I have to tell you, economists have some responsibility because they love dividing the world into highly simplistic categories and pretending that's reality. But, you know, we, we, we have tended to do that. I mean, you know, I, I hear people talk about, you know, free markets as, as if there's some kind of free market fundamentalism. Well, I, I don't actually know many economists who, who, who like would believe that, right? I mean, markets work when they have structure around them and regulation around them. And, and, and um, 
you know, and so so we have this indictment now of capitalism, you know, because it's been poorly managed because you know we've we've let it escape kind of kind of the boundaries that we need to put around it. You know, it's it's a little bit like when you're a parent raising a kid. You know, the natural state of human beings is selfishness, right? You see it in every two year old, and parents spend the first eighteen year olds. For first 18 years, trying to help their kids be other centered and and learn how to channel that selfishness. It's not like you just like like grow up wild like a flower, and and so we kind of profess like shock when capitalism, absent any any kind of constraints, you know, uh, uh, amplifies the worst of of human tendencies. But and then we say, well, the problem is capitalism. But I, you know, to me that's a little bit like blaming sex for STDs, uh, porno addiction, and unwanted pregnancies. I mean. The solution is not is, is not celibacy, probably. The solution is, like, how do you treat sex in some kind of responsible way? So I'd, I'd be interested, and then I want to turn it over to Michele. Like, how, how did we let this thing get so out of balance, right? Because you're saying, if you go back and look at the origin story of the Internet and so on, we did have rules around it. We had boundaries around it. But for some reason, we're now in, in, in a place where there are millions, millions of people who believe the system no longer works for them and that those boundaries are no longer effective in the right way. Well, I think boundaries and constraints isn't quite the right way to think about it. And I, in fact, in fact think that that language traps us because what we actually need is an acceleration of progress in governance to match the acceleration in progress of technology. Um, uh, Albert Einstein once said that... Um, if the organizing power of man had advanced as much as his tools had, that um, we would all have easy and carefree lives. But that as it is, we've put razor blades in the hands of three-year-old children. Um, and I think that that's fundamentally the problem. The, the problem is not that we don't have enough constraints on the process, but that we don't have enough progress in our ability to identify the challenges that stand in the way of further development, including the potential destructive effects that development can have without being channeled correctly and overcome them. One quick question then, because I know you've written about this, because I 100% agree, particularly with technology, what you have is the pace of evolution in technology is so much faster than the pace of evolution in, in how we govern, how we create public policy, how we come to agreement on things, which is why we're always trying to close, you know, the barn door after the whole horse is bolted. And, it, you know, Europe years later, you know, st says, let's do something about uh, 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 data privacy. And we're kind of behind that in the United States. So what would be your idea about how we accelerate, as you said, the kind of public policy priority shaping apparatus so that can, it can somehow keep up with a pace at which technology is changing our lives and will continue to change our lives? Well, I think that if you think about what democracy is, I think that there's fundamentally three elements and none of them we've really figured out a good way to scale. One is compromise. The ability of different people, many people to come together, give up on the things that are less important to them and you know, get the things that are most important to them. Deliberation the ability of people to have a conversation at scale to understand all the issues that other people are working with and to try to identify solutions that are out of the box and that honor everyone's values better than the you know things coming in and uh, pluralism the notion that even in spite of that we're going to disagree with each other there's going to be differences among us and those are not things to be you know uh, those are not problems, they're actually sources of energy and, and strength for us that we can harness to find good things in the future and that we should actually acknowledge and celebrate um, even as we try to work across them. And I don't think we've been good at scaling any of those things. So let me, let me give you illustration. So like, how do we make compromises at scale? We only do it through hierarchies. We elect people to do the same thing that we would do if we were in a New England town hall meeting with each other. We haven't actually found a way other than just have, pushing it off to someone else to, um, to engage with each other at scale. Um, so we can't really deliberate at scale. We haven't figured out how to do compromise at scale. We know that vote, you know, standard voting, all it does is let the majority rule. But the, but the majority ruling is not compromise. The majority ruling is the, is the opposite of compromise. It's, uh, it's just 
you know, giving one side victory, right? And we haven't figured out how to do pluralism. You know, we have this idea that there are states and that, you know, we represent the states and we have federalism by states. But, like, states are not the main divide in our society these days. We have divides over race. We have divides over location. We have divides... And we don't have any representation of those things and federalism by those things. So we haven't figured out how to do any of those things. But, you know, we now have solutions to those problems. Yeah, but you have a few thoughts on how to do that. So maybe give us Absolutely. give us a thought or two. And, and let's maybe, you know, Taiwan, I think, is, again, one of the examples you use of where they're using technology, have a more open, deliberative process to hear more voices. Um, t take us through an idea you have of, of how do you scale that up? Uh, in a way that clearly is not happening right now in, in, in democracy. Well, I'll give you a quick example of each of these. So on the case of deliberation, um, one of the amazing things that natural language processing allows us to do is to take a large number of statements and summarize them down to a small number of statements that are digestible. And what they've done in Taiwan is use that to facilitate deliberation at scale. And that might sound magical, but that's what happens on Wikipedia every day. People work together and they actually produce relatively concise, readable outputs um, that are part of a collective deliberation. And in Taiwan, they've used that to solve issues from gay marriage to the regulation of uh, ride sharing platforms um, in ways that have made them the most successful society in the world, I think, at addressing everything from misinformation to climate change to COVID-19. Can, can you give us some uh, the mechanics of that just on a particular issue, Glenn, yeah. so we understand so how it works? The notion is that everyone, you know, puts in a statement about what they think about an issue. Um, and then those statements get sort of clustered and filtered and grouped. And then synth synthetically out of that come a small number of things that everyone can read. Without any hierarchical, without anyone, this person's the representative of the, it just comes out of the natural language processing. And then everyone has the opportunity to offer new statements that try to synthesize or get past the divisions that were clear from the first cluster. And you attract support from the ability to get people supporting what you're saying that were across the initial divisions. And then again, it's summarized by NLP. And... You see, so you can actually have a thoughtful democratic conversation at scale using these tools. So sophisticated sentiment analysis. And uh, OK, so that was case one. Right. So how that's, do you that's deliberation. extract the point of views? Right. How do we do compromise at scale? Again, something they're doing in Taiwan. The notion is that everyone can be allocated a, a budget of credits to vote on issues or on statements, um, but that the more credits that you put on a given issue, the more expensive it becomes to put more on that issue. So that you're forced to temper your extreme feelings, um, even as you're able to express them. So that's that's what creates the sense of confidence. When you say it costs more, do, do I get a particular number of credits? And, yeah. And, so you get and if I use credits. it on one issue to have the same impact on the next issue, I have to give more? How, do, how does this work? On, on that issue. So uh, you can you know, can have impact on another issue for just as cheap, but if you want to have more impact on one issue, if you want to be more extreme, then it becomes increasingly expensive. Yeah. So an escalating uh, curve there. All right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Very interesting. So that's called quadratic voting, and that's that's a way of doing compromise at scale. And then pluralism at scale, I think, fundamentally is what n networks, social networks, can allow us to do. Because the thing is, you know, when they set up the U.S. Constitution, they set up the states or whatever. But like that's very static. That's a very that's a, that's a that's a you know snapshot of like what might have been the issues and the divisions in a society at one moment. But social networks give us a dynamic sense of what the divisions are. And you know, so far we've used social networks to trap people in filter bubbles and so forth. But but we could have the opposite approach. We could actually encourage. You know, what does the Senate do? It it has equal representation of the states, which forces people from different states to cooperate, even if one state could otherwise dominate, right? What if we had rules like that within the you know social media world? What if in order to do things, you had to find people who are social network distant from each other? You know, that would, that, that, that would lead to a basically different architecture. It would lead to one that actually generated pluralism, that celebrated these different groups, but also encouraged them to cooperate across each other.
You know, Glenn, one of the things, I, I love all three of those examples. Thank you for sharing that. You know, one of the things I felt for a long time is that, in fact, if you go back and you look at, 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 at long history, you find this to be true, that um, technology, let me say it differently, uh, organizational innovation, because what you're talking about, the technology to do this has been there for a while. You're talking about applying it in a different way. And what, what you find is that, that, that organizational innovation often lags technology innovation by decades, by generations, sometimes centuries, um, because the organizational habits and patterns, the political habits and patterns are very, very deeply set. And it seems to me that's kind of where we are now, even, even if I look at how companies are using technology, right? We're using things like Slack and Microsoft Teams to like, you know, uh, uh, bring more efficiency to white collar work right? Share documents, set up schedules. We're not thinking about these technologies to fundamentally change the way or like who has decision rights, how do you allocate resources, who gets to set strategy and so on. And I think, so as you think about this, you know, you, you look at, you, you, you talk about Taiwan, it's, you know, more or less monoculture, uh, what, 20 million people, 25 million people. It's not a huge, a huge country. How, talk us a little bit through how we go from here to there. And let's, let's stay in the sphere we're talking about now, more democracy, public policy. We'll, we'll have another conversation and, and go deeper into the corporate world. But, but what is the hope of, of organizing to make this happen when you have so much invested in the existing model, right? It's, it's not that these new models are so difficult to get your head around or impossible to think about. But it's sure hard to build to build a coalition that that will actually do it. Well, I think that Taiwan's a great example because while it's very easy to think like you know Asians monocultural, they all just get along with each other. Um, the the reality is that Taiwan has a lot of the same types of ethno cultural slash political divisions that beset the United States. There are actually several different ethnic groups there that represent different waves of migration to Taiwan. And those line up with the with both economic and with political divisions in the country. And the moment that really sort of got us got past those divisions was a moment of conflict with mainland China, which came uh, in 2014 when there was a trade deal that was going to be passed that would have allowed the Chinese tech stack to sort of pervade Taiwan. And there was a protest movement that actually occupied the national legislature, not so different from our January 6th moment. Um, but using some of these tools for consensus, deliberation, and pluralism at scale, they were able to channel that moment rather than to be one of division into one of unity that was actually accepted by the government to the point where the government appointed members of that protest movement as re reverse mentors to its own ministers. And then uh, the new government came into power and, and brought those people in as the actual ministers. And... Um, I think that it's often in these moments of threat where we see our values, uh, you know, where, where we see that they can't continue the way that they, they've continued, that we have a chance at, at real change. And, and I think the Taiwan story is actually directly relevant to us on those lines because, you know, the, the story of what's going on in Taiwan is one of the few things that I think could really unite people in, say, the United States uh, around this type of innovation because uh, everyone's afraid of the PRC. And uh, at the same time, the digital minister who did this is one of the first transgender uh, political leaders in the world. So it really brings together the concerns of the right and the left and, and the you know, focus on democracy, et cetera. So I, I, think, I think there's a real chance that that, that story can, can light the way uh, for many others and that it's not quite as exceptional uh, as it sounds. As, as we might first think. Well, I love that story, Glenn. And there are a couple of things I take away from that. First of all, you know, you do need a kind of existential threat in a way. And if you're paying attention to politics right now in our country, like it seems we're, you know, I don't want to say it's existential, but, you know, we're, we're kind of at each other's throats, more polarization. So if there's a time to try something different now, now would probably be it. The other thing, and maybe you could go deeper on this in the story for a moment, because as I understand it, what happened in, in, in Taiwan is they launched this new kind of deliberative process in parallel with the existing political process. It wasn't like we're just going to you know, throw one thing out and try something else. 
they were using this to debate issues, to bring thoughts together. You know, existing agencies and ministries could then bring bring the most popular or the ones that had a lot of support into the, the form of political process. But this was a kind of parallel set of experimentation, just like an open source, you know, somebody can fork the code, you can try something else. So am I misrepresenting it? How, how do they manage kind of the risk of allowing this new thing to gain credibility for people to have confidence in this uh, without kind of blowing up what was already there? So one of my favorite thinkers, Hannah Arendt, has a wonderful book called On Revolution. I've read it. In which she <laughs> distinguishes between the American and the French revolutions. And she says that, you know, the thing about the American revolution is that they established legitimacy before authority. Whereas in the French Revolution, they established authority before legitimacy. Um, you know, in the American Revolution, there were practices of local democracy built up over long periods of time, and people saw them working better than was, you know, the rule from Britain. And so then they said, let's throw off the rule from Britain and empower the thing that's working, right? Um, whereas in France, they said, we don't like this. We're just going to lop off the head and let's see what we can put in its place, right? And uh, Audrey, the digital minister of Taiwan, calls herself a conservative anarchist, which is that she believes in allowing these different possibilities to emerge, but th through their legitimacy on the terms of the existing system, you know, not on the not through some sort of violent upheaval. And and I think that's uh, that's the way that, you know, real lasting uh, valuable change takes place. Yeah, I mean, that that brings kind of full circle to where we started about kind of, you know, getting beyond categorical thinking, because, you know, I've had this thought, Glenn, I mean, you know, as as most of all a pragmatist, you know, watching left and right uh, kind of demonize and destroy each other is deeply disconcerting, because I believe there's truth in both. I mean, you know, a conservative would say, embedded in our institutional arrangements, organized religion, family, constitutional government, whatever those things are, school systems, embedded in that is a lot of hard won wisdom around how you order society in ways that are effective. Having said that, it's easy for conservatives to venerate the past and fall in love with it and, and try to preserve things that are not working anymore or very unequal. You know, progressives, on, on, on the other hand, you know, kind of, I think, often have this utopian view of, about the perfectibility of human beings, and, but, but, but are driven by a genuine need, things need to be better. You know, these in, in, inequities cannot stand. But if conservatives venerate the past, I think sometimes the progressives vandalize the past. But there hasn't been, and, and it seems to me there's a lot of people who profit in some ways of keeping us at each other's throats. What you're describing here, what Taiwan has, has done, is a way of, of, of creating a new commons where these things can, can be debated and addressed in subtle ways with both viewpoints represented, rather than having us behind the barricades, you know, throwing metaphorical or real bricks at each other. Well, I think it's even beyond that. I, I think that to me, the essence of pluralism is to say that not only do we need to transcend these divides, that's not actually the point, but that these divides are actually sources of strength. Um, that's actually how we get to good solutions, is by dealing with these different perspectives. Um, because I, I think one of the deepest truths in conservatism is pluralism. I think conservatism be be believes profoundly that, no, it's not just the state. It's not just the this or that. It's, it's all of the complexity that is built up over that time that's valuable. And I think that's absolutely right. And I think progressivism says, no, it's not static. It's not like, so, so societies are dynamic. And I think that's profoundly correct as well. And that it's really at the synthesis between them, which we haven't been able to achieve, um, that we have the possibility of something different. It's like in seeing the complex but dynamic system uh, that is the world that we actually have the chance for the both the most rapid progress and the deepest pluralism. So your your recommendation, if I'm understanding it, and, and, and again, we haven't done, done justice to this today. Please, you know, read, 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 read the book, uh, Radical Markets, dig into, we'll put up links, dig into Glenn's thinking. It's very, very useful. 
But but is your way forward as you think about the example of Taiwan and using technology to kind of you know uh, have this deliberative democracy in a, in a different kind of way? Is the starting point that we should be trying this at the at the level of cities or counties or local government, and we see what works and scale it up, or you know what's what's your vision of the way forward here? I don't think pluralism only happens in levels of government or something like that. I think that's one way to do it. But I think it also happens in different civic organizations, in corporations, in in all sorts of different things that are subsidiary to the imagined totality. But even the nation state is not the totality. The world is the totality. So it's there's all different levels. And, and it's because of the pluralism of the world as it actually exists that there's a chance for these sorts of things to emerge. You can start from anywhere um, and at any level in, in experimenting with these, these types of things. Yeah, well, that's, that's certainly our view as well, that uh, you know, complex, deeply entrenched systems do not start with some big grand re- redesign from the top. It starts with experimentation and people willing to try things. Uh, Glenn, we've, we've left a lot you know, that we wanted to cover today and we've run out of time. Um, I'm hoping you'll be able to come back and we can dig into how all of this applies for how large corporations are run, how large organizations, institutions, public and private are run, uh, which are, you know, as we would argue, often inertial, uh, often incremental, in many ways inhuman, and we need a revolution and how they're organized as, as much as anything else. And and, and thank you for pointing us back again to this possibility, this need to be deeply imaginative about how the way we organize human beings together. So deep, deep thank you for those thoughts. Uh, we'll provide the links and we hope we are, we're going to have the chance to talk to you again and go, go deeper. We're looking forward to it, Gary. Real, really fun conversation. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank Hire for underwriting the costs of producing this interview. Hire is the world's leading appliance company and also a global leader in the Internet of Things. For the last decade, Hire has been leading a remarkable revolution in management. It has proven that even the largest, most complex organizations in the world can be entrepreneurial at their core. Now, back to our conversation. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to the New Human Movement. Uh, Today, Gary and I are continuing our conversation with Glenn Weil, who is the Microsoft's uh, Office of the Chief Technology Officer, Political Economist, and Social Technologist. I think I got that right, Octopest, uh, yeah. uh, which is, the, I think, the coolest corporate acronym out there by a mile. So kudos on that, Glenn. <laughs> and in that role, Glenn advises uh, the company Microsoft on the future of technology um, in relationship to political and economic change, and uh, he manages a research group focused on uh, fostering a vision of technology that that supports collaboration uh, rather than centralization and automation. And and Glenn is the co-author of a very influential book he uh, wrote with Eric Posner in 2018 called Radical Markets, and the book has inspired a social movement called Radical Exchange that convenes people of all kinds, you know, art activists, artists, entrepreneurs, and researchers who are all keen on using information technology and, and market mechanisms to create a, a, a more rich and, and more equal society. So, uh, Glenn, um, welcome back uh, to the New Human Movement. Thanks for making the time to talk to us again. It's, it's an honor to be with you guys, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Well, let's let's get going. And, 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 and Glenn, maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about the kinds of problems you and other folks at the Radical Exchange are really passionate on solving. And um, if I uh, remember the premise or the mission statement of Radical Exchange, it's to, quote, modernize and innovate the basic institutions of democracy and markets. So can you tell us a little bit about that? You know, uh, you know, unpack the premise. What does modernizing mean, right, in this context? And, and why is this a pressing problem? So Albert Einstein once said that if the organizing power of man had kept pace with his tools and weapons, that we would all have carefree and happy lives. But that as it is, we've put uh, razor blades in the hands of three-year-old children. And I really think of that as kind of an epigraph for all the work I do. I think we need to 
accelerate the pace of innovation and governance to match the pace of change of the tools that connect us. We need ways to extend to a global scale with millions of people the type of richness that we have in you know small communities and uh, groups that are smaller than the Dunbar number, et cetera. And that to me is uh, really what stands before us. And I think if we don't solve that problem, if we don't manage to accelerate our social technologies to keep pace with our physical technologies, our physical technologies will destroy us. Um, it won't just slow our growth. We'll actually, uh, you know, destroy uh, all that we have. You know, you can think of global warming as just an example of one of the many things that happens when we're not able to adapt the pace of governance to keep up with the pace of what technology does. Certainly, can I just say there, I mean, certainly that's been a problem as humanity that we've been struggling with for some time. If, if I recall, you know, the League of Nations came out of World War I and this desire to avoid another, you know, mass conflagration, which of course it didn't. Uh, you have things like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that are, you know, trying to cope with the spread of, of, of uh, uh, nuclear weapons around the world. So it does seem like we're in this constant running catch-up battle with our tools keep getting better, but... But I'm wondering, it's, it's not only that our institutions don't change as fast. I'm not sure that our, that our moral inclinations are, you know, are, are changing as fast as we're becoming more powerful, can, can change our environment, can kill each other in like these immense ways. And yet uh, our institutions and maybe even our ethics is not keeping. Is that, is that kind of the essence of your argument here? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure our ethics are the primary thing that needs to change, at least on its own. If you think of the evolution of the human body, the underlying cells in the human body did change. But the primarily, you know, what creates complex life is the adaptation of the ways in which those cells interact with each other. And those collective institutions uh, and their dynamism is really what offers opportunities, um, even for moral change, because the reality is most morality comes from our affiliations with social groups and our relationships to each other rather than just our internal state. So I think that problem of social organization is at the core of uh, the challenges that face us, whether they're in the form of productivity or in the form of politics. So, so Glenn, can you maybe say a little bit more about the lack of progress in, in kind of social innovation, institutional innovation? Where did things start to stagnate and, and why? Well, first of all, I think... Uh, things have, in some sense, been stagnating for a very, very long time. Um, there's a wonderful book by David Graeber and David Wengro that came out in the fall, which really talks about how, uh, if you look over the long sweep of human history, uh, much more than we thought, there was huge amounts of social innovation and organizational innovation uh, in the history of uh, societies. And that has sort of gotten progressively ossified. And I think that Part of the reason that that's the case is that adapting social organizations to match technologies has been uh, really uh, challenging. And social organizations usually adapt quite slowly. They may be much more robust. They much be, may be much more functional if they adapt over those long periods of time. But with technology moving so fast, it's been hard to help them keep pace. We haven't had a science of social design and social reimagination to match the science of, of physical technologies. I think we can get there, but I, th I think it's been missing. And I think as a result, we've just had slow and not very imaginative change in our social institutions. And we've gotten even worse, I think, since the 1970s. I think this whole neoliberal thing really froze us because it said, oh, there's just this very simplistic imagination of capitalism that will do it all. And that stopped us from having to actually think about what could be more ambitious ways of organizing uh, society. You know, a practical example of that, uh, I, I think, Glenn, let me test this and see if this is the kind of, because uh, because if I understand it, your premise is that our social organization are changing much slower than our tools, than our technologies. And one wonderful example of that uh, in, a, in a book uh, on, on military innovation talked about when muskets got introduced to European warfare. 
And before that, uh, battle formations had had many ranks because the archers shot over the heads of the archers in front of you. The arrows, you know, were on that kind of trajectory. And, and, and they went back and looked at how long it took for those military formations to change so they were long and thin and better suited to, to, to rifles, to muskets. And, and it took almost 100 years. And their argument was that, that the limitation was, you know, uh, uh, several generations of generals had to die out before you could really optimize the organization for this new, this new tool and, and, and this new weapon. And uh, is, that, is that part of the argument, that somehow the pace of organizational evolution is just so much slower than the pace of technological evolution? Well, yeah, so I think you just gave a great example, Gary. Like, think about the phalanx, right? The phalanx is, you know, a form of organization that evolved over a very long time in, in you know, ancient Greece. Um, and didn't actually require a lot of central organization. Like, so you can basically do a phalanx with mo basically local principles of adjacency and things like this. And so um, it was possible to sort of have a kind of very democratic horizontal system that was aligned with the, the, the phalanx. Now, you could have, a, a, you know, over a very long period of time, evolved something like that that worked for muskets, right? But it probably would have been quite a slow process of sort of feeling around and working with that. But technology was advancing. You needed to try to keep up with that. And so the only way to do it ended up being like, you know, Napoleon comes in and orders everybody uh, to, to reorganize and you get levy on mass and, you know, this whole new way that, that's adapted to these new technologies. But the question is, can we come up with a way to innovate those social forms more quickly? If we can, uh, we don't have to either rely on some general ordering us to do it or on this incredibly slow process of social change. We can actually have a process of social change that's adapted to the speed of, of, of those new tools. And that, I think, is way more powerful than either sort of a centralizing approach that sort of gives up on that power and robustness of the human intelligence or one that's just sort of stuck in these stagnant forms that aren't adapted to our new uh, technological organizations. Let me throw out two thoughts there quickly. Um, one is, you know, I think there's a reason some people are suspicious of large wholesale social reorganization. You know, we've tried that a few times in history and it usually doesn't work well. We have some utopian view and, and that was, you know, that was uh, 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 the Nazis and that was communism and so on. And, uh, you know, and that was Mao's, you know, cultural revolution. And usually those, those attempts to radically, massively reorganize society end up, you know, uh, producing kind of dangerous tyrannies. So maybe, maybe we can come back to that. That's like, I, there's a reason people may be skeptical about anybody's idea to like, let's, let's quickly and comprehensively reorganize society. But the other thing I wanted just to come back to your point, we see this in, in, in much more prosaic ways in the organizations we work with. So if you think of collaborative technology, it seems to me the way most companies are using that today, you know, they have Slack and they have, you know, your teams can talk to each other. They have Microsoft Teams. Basically, we're using those technologies to do for the productivity of white collar teams what Microsoft Office did 30 years ago to individuals, right? So we'll connect people and they can share some ideas. They can, you know, schedule calendars. They can share documents. They can have meetings. Very few companies have used this technology, for example, to crowdsource strategy, to go to the whole organization and say, what's your point of view about who we should become? And, and it seems that, that the real sticking point maybe here in social evolution is not that we don't have new ideas, not that people don't have ideas about how we, how, how we change our organizations, but you have a very deeply entrenched power structure who's not necessarily that interested in, in, in decentralizing, in democratizing, in giving up their prerogatives. And that you know, that may be the break on this. So, you know, one, one, there may be a reason people are a little suspicious of this. And number two, if this isn't happening, you know, how do you deal with the entrenched power structures that are quite comfortable with, you know, the way society works right now? And is the only way to change them in something that, that like ends up being kind of a revolution and fairly bloody. So first of all, I think it depends a lot on what type of social change you're thinking of. And in fact, whether it's the right direction or not. So I think the, the right direction of social change is profoundly pluralistic. It's not totalizing. It doesn't have a, a single view. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It, it views um, the diversity and sort of emergence of human organizations as precisely the things that need to be optimized for. And that vision, unlike some of these others, naturally has allied to it a theory of change that's 
very multi-scale. Scale. It can start very local. It can start very large. It can start in between, and that's probably its you know perfect spot, right? And uh, because it doesn't think that oh, there's one system. It thinks there's many systems and many layers. And wherever you start, you can make that organization more productive by using these things. And that helps get around a lot of the problems that you were just describing, Gary, because you don't have to stop at the top of the organization and, and have a single point of bottleneck. You can start wherever there's a creative person who wants to experiment with things and practices can spread from there based on the efficacy of the organization that's created that way. But, but Glenn, you know, you mentioned the fact that there's a paucity of vision or we don't really have many alternatives, but at least when it comes to organization, in, you know, at, in the, at the level of like an individual firm or, 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 or nonprofit doesn't have to be a for-profit uh, uh, enterprise, you know, ideas about lateral, uh, you know, uh, flat lateral community driven networked organization has been around for 50, 60 years. Uh, you know, there were bold visions of technology-driven decentralization and peer production and so on advanced by Eric Raymond and a lot of other people in the early 90s, right, who were already foreseeing what technology would allow us to do. And every generation seems to kind of discover these truths. And then, but I'm not sure that um, they're acting upon them. Uh, so, you know, going back to, I want to depress you maybe a little bit more on what Gary was saying. Is it that we don't really know what some of these answers are? Is it that the tools themselves have, have so far proved rudimentary and therefore they're not very practical? Or is it that, like, you know, the the people at the top of the pyramid, given the fact that all these ideas are, are, are profoundly countercultural and, and anti-authoritarian, are just able to co-opt them, to marginalize them, or to or you know, wait to hijack them and make them tools of centralization and, and, and in greater authority. I do think there are fundamental limitations to the things that have been developed so far. We they're not like these. Almost none of the things that you're describing actually have the same relationship to social science theory that the technologies that we use have to computer science theory or to or the physical tools we have to, to physics. They're not actually, in any sense, optimized or derived from and sort of formal systems that allow some sort of scalable, reproducible, like, that's not what they, they have been. They've been interesting thinking and experiments from a much more bottom-up perspective, or at best, um, they've been sort of people who are not sort of really like social science, quantitative uh, uh, you know, thinkers trying to feel around these spaces. Th they've been great. I love their work. It's, it, it's been a great inspiration, but it's not the sort of thing that like you could run on a blockchain or whatever, you know, it's like, it's more some set of practices that all sorts of people have to learn huge amounts about and invest in, in order to, and, and sort of get indoctrinated, whatever. They're, they're not these just, it's not like a game that you can play or, a or a you know algorithm that you can run, and and I think we need things that have that value set, and and I think there's also some things sort of a little bit missing from the way that those values are constructed philosophically, but that we can talk about. But but overall, I think they're in the right place. But then you need to actually say like, okay, if the market is the optimal mechanism in this very particular set of circumstances that aren't don't really correspond to the world that we live in. Um, what are closer to optimal mechanisms for the actual situations that we live in? And, and that just has, hasn't, there's, there's nothing like that really out there. Can I just jump in? I, I think that's true, but I also throw out a caveat. And, or let me start with a caveat. I mean, clearly, social innovation is way more difficult than technical innovation. First of all, you got, you know, bits and atoms don't, don't, don't ask you whether you want to experiment on them. They, like, you just, you know, you write code, you try things. Uh, if you want to do social experimentation, you have to have the permission of your subjects. And, uh, you know, you, you and, and there, there, there are a lot of ethical issues involved in doing that. So certainly just technically, you know, it's not as simple. Uh, and you have a lot of people today doing uh, behavioral science research, but they're doing it, you know, in laboratories with willing subjects. And they're not often experimenting with more complex social systems, which just is like an order of magnitude, I would argue, more difficult to do than, uh, you know, than, than, than writing code. Having said that, uh, Glenn, what where 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 it seems to me 
like you're making a very powerful argument, and Michaela and I would agree, is that we really haven't had any, you know, we there's there's no market for social innovation, for social experiment. There's no way of of, of, of encouraging people to do this. There's no way of sharing those ideas globally, seeing what's working, what's not working. We've tried to do this inside of certain organizations, but but it does seem like this problem of innovating at the institutional level, we, we really haven't put our minds to how to scale that up. And it's always going to be difficult, but how to do it in, 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 in a more disciplined way, simple hypotheses, localized tests, sharing the results, learning together, you know, leveraging up. It just, you know, the, the, the kind of big science that you see that did the Human Genome Project or did Large Hadron, it just doesn't seem we brought that kind of energy and thought together around how we evolve, you know, our institutions. Well, let, let me say a few things about that. So the first one is um, uh, to, to really agree with your last point. Um, the, the attitude that I usually get to social innovation is either that it's trivial or that it's impossible. And, and often people toggle back and forth between those two things in the same sentence. They'll be like, oh, that's not, there's nothing. I mean, like some voting, whatever. That's some like little trivial, like whatever. You know, that it's, oh, oh you, you, the, you know, this, that's not a real science problem. You know, that's just, you know, or they'll say, Oh, but that'll never change. I mean, that that sort of institution is is completely. I mean, that's just like it's it's worthless to do. Like the attitude that no, it's hard, but it requires. But with you know a, a good investment and a good amount of work, we can actually make major change. That that's the attitude that we need to get to because you'll never make important progress on anything if you have the attitude that it's completely out of your hands. It's either completely fixed or it's trivial. It's only if we make concerted and coordinated investments that we have a chance of making that social change. Doing so, however, requires what I would call a, d a different fundamentally approach to experimentation. Um, w you know, even in your language, you talked about sort of randomized controlled trials or whatever. But that's not the right way to think about social innovation, I don't think. The right way to think about it is experimentation with rather than experimentation on. In experimentation on, you view the things that you're experimenting on as kind of passive. You know what you want to measure. You go into it. You try to control as much as possible. And that's the way that most social science experimentation works. That's the, that's the paradigm people have come to. That's A-B testing. But real social innovation doesn't come from that. Real social innovation comes from experimentation with. And by the way, that's true for most physical technologies, because what really matters about physical technologies is the way they integrate with social systems. So like, you know, we don't go and do a randomized controlled trial for the most part. I'm not saying we don't do this in any context, but it's not really very useful to like take a VR headset and like randomly assign some people are going to live with a VR headset for a year and other people are not. And then we're going to like measure, I don't know, like, you know, the temperature of their skin or, or the, you know, their, their rating on some self-reported scale after a year. Like nobody knows what people are going to do with VR headsets and they're going to create things for it anyways. And that's going to be part of what's interesting. Like experimentation with is a process where there's a circular relationship between the innovator and the participants where that, that that's a that's a relationship of, of much greater equality. It's not like I'm just going to measure some thin, thin thing from you. You're actually going to speak back to me. And then my next iteration is going to come from the process of having worked with your community and and it's going to spread horizontally ra rather than to the experimenter and then out through well, i would, I would I mean? add to that glenn because i i 100 agree and i think that's that's been a limit not that it doesn't have its value but that's been a limit of, of a lot of behavioral science uh research the experimental research it it it, it is in it is in it is in kind of a laboratory uh it and it's it's mainly aimed at characterizing behavior or characterizing a system, right? Most most famously, all the work that's been done to understand kind of our intellectual biases and so on. And, and you can do that. But the kind of innovation you're talking about is, is not simply innovation to characterize, it's innovation to change. It's focused on invention, not simply on understanding. And, and I can tell you within the business school world, almost none of that is going on. Literally, 
you know, all of my colleagues working in business schools all over the world doing all of this research and all of their academic journals, a tiny, tiny fraction of that research is actually what you would call kind of experimentation with, innovation with, designed to test new methods, new tools, so on to see what works. It's just like, it's, we can come back to why, but it's basically not happening, which is like kind of insane. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and let me come come back as well to like you know, is it easier to technologically innovate versus socially innovate? And I think in some sense, for the reasons you said, yes. And at the same time, I would sort of challenge it because I would say it's true it may be easier, but it's also almost completely useless to technologically innovate without socially innovating at least to some extent. So like, there's a great example that um, the the great UI theorist Donald Norman. Um, uh, always gives, which is that video conferencing, like we're doing right now, was invented in the 1880s. It was first demoed in the 1920s. It was first commercialized in the 1950s. But in and actually, his book ends before this even comes. He, sa he says in his book, and it was ne it has never really gained broad adoption. It finally did as a result of a pandemic, not as a result of any technological advance, because of a social fact, right? And um. Therefore, it's like, you, yes, you can you can innovate technologies in some controlled sense, but it's actually has almost no meaning to any human life, except for like a bomb, like a, where it's really a negative impact on human life, right? Um, uh, it has no positive impact on human life unless it's accompanied by at least some social innovation. Yeah, and what you need f for that, Glenn, at least is what I'm hearing you say, and I I would agree with if if I'm interpreting you correctly, is that you almost need. Um, this needs to be elevated at the level of a social, like societal priority. Like it is a fundamental, you know, this is the, uh, what limits the performance of our society is sort of our institutional architecture, the degree to which we innovate. And we just need to all focus on that. I mean, I think the last, at least the most salient example of that in recent history, at least when it comes to innovation within firms um, in my mind is, you know, a scientific management that during the progressive era where, yeah, Taylor had done a few experiments, Frederick Taylor, and it kind of seemed to work, but it wasn't 100% sure. But the whole idea of removing waste and increasing efficiency became um, a huge priority, right? A way to solve problems of inequality, of making things more affordable for more people, Right. And 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 it was through that kind of embrace of this as a real uh, priority that then the technology of scientific management got applied more, uh, more, more broadly. And, and right now there is no consensus right around that. Yeah. I mean, people might say, yeah, you know, things that we can improve things at the margin or maybe we should fight, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, reduce inequality a little bit or, or so on. But but it, we don't have anything like that ambition. Of, of a whole, you know, of, um, of, of a deep, deep uh, rethinking about our, our institutions. I don't, I don't know if you agree with that. Quite the opposite, Michele. It's, it's like we're, we're profoundly socially constipated on this issue. We're like, we've got this notion that like, we're, we're hopeless about it. We, we think like, you know, it's, some people say it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Like there's way more um, uh, science fiction which is about, you know, catastrophe than there is about like actually different social systems coming into existence. Can I just back up one second, though? Because there's a premise which I'm not arguing with, but I just think we need to make it explicit, uh, you know, uh, and, and explore for a moment. Because, you know, you're, you're, you're arguing, Glenn, that, that, that our, our social institutions, and by the way, in many, many ways, we, we agree. It's the premise of, of our, our, our book on humanocracy. But you're arguing that uh, institutional innovation has lagged far beyond technological innovation, and we're paying a price for that. That our institutions, in some way, are failing us. Can can you like fairly concisely? Can you give us a bit of your diagnosis? Like you know, so 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 if if we need to uh, uh, you know accelerate the pace of social innovation, why? What 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 are the failings? What are the problems that we're trying to solve? Uh, that can only be solved if we're able to reimagine some of these fundamental uh, 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 ways our institutions work. Let me give two sides of, of a story, uh, and this applies to both of them. There's, there's those people out there who are like, we need way faster technological progress. We need way higher economic growth, you know, et cetera. Well, if you want way higher economic growth, 
the fundamental thing that any economic theory will tell you is you need to accelerate increasing returns processes. You need innovation that is not depletable. You need more networks. You need more like people working together. You need to take advantage of those economies of scale. That's where all innovation comes from. But we also know that market systems don't do that. We know just basic economic theory says that market systems, when you have those sort of networks, whatever, they'll tend to get monopolies um, or there will tend to be underfunding of those things that generate all that value, all that innovative activity. So we, if, you, if you're someone who's like raw, raw economic growth, you need this. On, if you're someone who's more of a degrowth mindset, like we're going to destroy the planet, we're going to blow ourselves up, whatever, you also desperately need this. Because the market system is going to throw off all these externalities and, uh, you know, arguably those are destroying the world, right? Um, arguably they're causing climate change, which, you know, could wipe us out. They could lead to some AI system, which might, you know, kill everybody. They, they, they're destroying the oceans, whatever. But those externalities, those systemic effects of these increasing returns technologies, these accelerating exponential technologies, none of those are being captured by our current schemes, and we're generating these externalities at a pace that we can't keep up with, that, that we have no governance mechanism to keep up with those externalities, and eventually we just fall behind them and they just eat us. Either side that you're on, whether you think the biggest problem in the world is not enough growth, which is you know some chunk of people, or the biggest problem in the world is um, is like we're going to destroy ourselves, or if you think you know inequality is the biggest issue. And like, you know, we're not, we don't, we haven't figured out how to have an egalitarian society in this world. Like in all of those paradigms, it becomes incredibly important to address this problem of like, how do we do democracy or, or management of these common effects at scale? Can I ask you though, Clay, because you, one could argue, yes, you have externalities and you have problems of monopoly due to increasing returns to scale, but we do have tools right now in our arsenals, but we, you know, taxation, carbon tax for, for pollution, for instance, or like fierce antitrust, we, we just are not willing to use them. So it's less about you know inventing new ways of tackling these issues and more about applying existing tools more more vigorously. And what do you say to that? I would disagree. I don't actually think that those tools will will really do the job because you know yeah you can do antitrust. You can slap down some company that becomes a monopoly, right? But slapping down a company as they become a monopoly doesn't actually solve the underlying problem. You try to break up Facebook, you'll get another network effect, unless you find a way to actually manage that new way of us interacting with each other as a sort of some form of a common resource. And like the standard public utility approach doesn't work because it's international. And like, it's just, we don't, we don't actually know how to manage that as some sort of a genuine increasing returns public. We don't, we don't know how to do that. Um, so, so that's not going to work there. I, is taxation going to work? Well, traditional forms of taxation are either going to slow investment or they are and and they're going to miss a lot of the like non-physical assets that are now critical to this world so they don't they're not even really going to extract the relevant uh benefits from that do carbon taxes work well how do you monitor carbon in a way that isn't like a surveillance state that owns the entire world not, not at all clear. And even if you think that that works, how do you do the innovation to come up with the new technologies that make the carbon tax not so burdensome? You know, the carbon tax will create some incentive for those, but if the innovation machine isn't working well, then you don't actually overcome the underlying problem, right? Or, or even if you think carbon tax is going to do it all magically, we haven't managed to pass a carbon tax. So how is it that we actually build social systems that can quickly, and, and it's been a while, right? And what if we have some new thing that comes along that's much worse than global warming, which it could be like this AI risk stuff, right? And, and we only have five years to address it, right? And we can't just like sit around waiting for the carbon tax to work its way through. The, so, so like, I actually don't think any of those examples are ones where, where the playbook is, is getting the job done. I mean, I, I certainly would agree with that in the sense and that, you know, the way, the way we might put it is that, you know, the problems we face are multiplying much faster than our organizations are becoming or becoming more capable, right? There's, there's just a lag between the speed, the complexity of these new challenges, whatever, whatever they are, you know, the risk that AI may pose, the global, global warming and so on, then, then our organizations become more capable. I, I might like to come back for just a moment on, like, why 
you know, why this, this argument that we're not really innovating around our institutions? And in many ways, we're very sympathetic to that argument, right? I mean, we've, we've talked about within, within our world, within the world of management, right, which is how, how organizations turn inputs into outputs, that, that we've seen a, a definitely an S-curve there, that, that over the last 40 or so years, there's been very little fundamental innovation in the way large companies are run. And, and that's why we see, you know, flattening productivity and so on. But I guess the question is, why, you know, why, why, why is that flattened out? Because I could argue that we're, we're seeing more social innovation right now than we've ever seen in human history, right? The, uh, uh, so, social media is the biggest social experiment we've ever done as a species with no hypotheses, with, with no real clear understanding of where, but I can tell you it is changing how, how, how cognitive development happens in kids. It's changing how, how, how relationships uh, uh, happen, how people meet each other. It has enormous consequences and a huge amount of controversy and people on both sides. So it's, it's not as if like social innovation is not happening, but it doesn't seem to be happening in any kind of thoughtful, uh, disciplined uh, way. It just, you know, suddenly we're connected. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the social media is a great example. Like, there, there's nothing derived from some sort of like normative social theory crossed with sociology that went into any of how social media has evolved. Social media has been like someone's like, oh, I can put this little tweet out there, or like you know, oh, like let's just. No, no, no. I, by, and by contrast, I think people very well understood that this is a dopamine delivery system. It is based on deep psychology. It is based on deep understanding of how human beings respond to particular incentives. So. You know whether we want to talk about that or not, but it wasn't just you know let's see what happens. I mean, this is all built on very very deep understanding of of uh, uh, you know of, of how the human brain works. Yeah, but, but it was but it was all but what you just said was incredibly individualistic. It, it was not actually about the forms of social organization that we're creating. It was about addiction of people as at an individual level to their interactions. And, and, and it was funded by this advertising business model, which was a, really a fundamentally individualistic business model. You know, it's like, what if you'd had things that were based on, you know, how people are actually interacting socially? And like, what is the nature of that organization? And is that organization perform Like, that's interesting, right? What's, what's much less interesting is something that's purely based on the capitalist incentive that, like, I want to get this person engaged so I can sell something to them. That's fundamentally not social media. That's really anti-social media. It's like harnessing the social relations to break down the social fabric rather than harnessing it to build a, 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 an operative social fabric, you know? So, so, Glenn, so far we've talked about the need for accelerating social innovation, the fact that we don't have the right mechanisms for that, you know, we're just, we just, you know, taxation and regulation may not, may not do the, the job. Now you, you and your, your colleagues have proposed a number of, of, of mechanisms that could actually, you know, uh, uh, solve some of this dilemma, right? So that would advance, you know, um, plurality, you know, community and, and decentralization. So can you maybe pick one or two of these, perhaps it's quadratic voting, perhaps it's another, and, and tell us a little bit of, uh, more about about such such a mechanism. Well, well, let me let me give you just like a overview of what I think of as the key properties of what I would call democratic or uh, just you know thoughtful decision making in relatively small groups. And what I would say those are are um, deliberation, compromise, mm -hmm. and plurality. So what do I mean by those? Or pluralism. Deliberation is that we have a process of talking through all of the issues from all of our perspectives and trying to find creative solutions that are not like just embracing one perspective or the other, but instead like get past the divide, right? Synthesis, yeah. Um, and anyone who's ever been in part of, part of like a thoughtful group decision knows that that's a core of what goes on, right? A, a second thing, is that eventually you have to make a decision. So you can't go on and do that deliberation forever. So you need some way, once you get to it, to make compromises, which requires people giving up on the things that are not important to them and getting the things that are most important to them or getting in the future on an issue that's more important to them their way, right? Um, and the third element is pluralism, which is to say, we don't erase the differences between us in this process. 
we actually celebrate them. We view them as the source of progress that we had to have this sort of conflict of ideas. And we try to defer to people on the areas of their expertise as much as possible. And when there are areas that involve multiple expertise, we seek sort of consensus or unlikely consensus across those groups. That is, we don't just have like a vote. We actually say, no, we need to make sure we hear all the different perspectives. Even if one perspective is held by a majority, it's when we're able to get consensus across the different perspectives that something goes forward, right? And those mechanisms are so critical to how we make good decisions in small groups. Like any thoughtful business process will tell you about how to do this in small groups. But how is it that you scale that to large groups of people? Um, my, my view is that there are tools that are emerging that let us do that. Um, and what are those tools? Well, to do deliberation, you basically need to go beyond broadcast to what I would call broad listening. You have to have one person be able to digest all the perspectives that are in a conversation in a reasonable period of time. And machine learning, statistics, artificial intelligence are perfect tools for doing that. What they basically do is they take a very large amount of information and they're able to condense it into a small number of representative perspectives that that can offer. So can you just just on that one point, can you, can I stop you? Where have you seen, what is the best current case of where I, I, AI or machine learning has taken vast quantities of uh, qualitative text that reflects the opinions, the viewpoints of, you know, thousands of different people and, and made sense of that in some compelling way? Where, where would we look to see that? The best example, I think, is the Taiwanese digital democracy. Um, and they had a phenomenal deliberation using a very primitive platform called Polis that just scratches the surface of doing this. But they, they used this platform to come up with how they were going to regulate uh, ride sharing in the country. Um, and it was a very creative solution that I think almost everyone would agree was like an excellent solution. And it came out of precisely this, this type of process. Can you unpack that process for us a little bit, Glenn, just exactly how the platform worked? I know it's rough, but, but how it matched people of different perspectives. So basically what happens is that everyone in plain text enters in what they think about the issue, right? Just, it could be emotive, it could be, you know, directional, but they, they put that in. And then people get a random selection of um, things that are input by other people. And they just say whether they agree or disagree. That's it. No, no response, etc. People then get clustered based on the pattern of their opinions. And then from that cluster, the opinion that got the most strong support is surfaced as the representative opinion of that group. Everyone is then able to read through all of those representative opinions. And then those representative opinions form the basis of sort of the next stage of the conversation where people now start proposing things that they think could get consensus across those different groups. And the rating in the next version is based on the degree of unlikely consensus you manage to achieve across those groups. And then those things surface. And you can kind of iterate that process until you get, you know, rough consensus on a set of opinions. And this is what we governance within radical exchange as well, by the way. Right. But and just to give people a scale of the number of participants, this wasn't just, a, you know, the, the equivalent of a New England you know, town meeting, right? It's like tens of thousands of people, tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people in, in some cases. Right. And they've done this now for several issues, right? So this has proven itself to be a valid way of... It's not just several issues. They actually have a platform that, that, that where this is the core component, where a quarter of the country are monthly active users. So it's like, it's, it's almost the whole, it's almost like the social media landscape is a significant component of it, is precisely this type of a process. And can you say more about then the impact this has had on the traditional political institutions? of Taiwan, how, how have they kind of adjusted to this reality of a quarter of the million, uh, uh, you know, a quarter of the population just deliberating on, on issues that they were uh, exclusively responsible for, you know, pre-platform, right? Pre, pre, pre the, uh, well, I'll give you the best example is the one that was actually at the genesis of this, which is the way this actually got started at a large scale was initially developed within this sort of uh, civic hacker community. But it went to scale when there was an invasion of the National Assembly. So think January 6th, 
but in Taiwan, right? But they actually managed to occupy the National Assembly. Um, it was the issue was around a trade agreement with China and the fears that that would uh, negatively impact the freedom of the tech sector within Taiwan. And they used this platform for the protesters rather than just all, you know, being rowdy to come up with a platform that they would demand the government adopt. And that platform was uh, rather than, you know, being the source of social division or whatever, it was so coherent and clear and persuasive that the government directly adopted the le legislative language that was generated by this group. And then um, it not only did that, it said that this was such an effective process that every government minister is going to have to re have a reverse mentor that comes from this movement. A, a young person that would help them learn how to do their job better. And then it was so popular, they didn't think that was enough. They kicked out the government at the time, and they put in a new government that was allied to this movement. And that new government appointed the leader of this, this woman, Audrey Tong, as the digital minister um, in charge of building this platform. And it's, it's so legitimate that like some large fraction of all the things the government does basically bubble up out of this civic community. That's pretty amazing. Very, very, very compelling example, and uh, we, we'd encourage anybody who wants to know more to dig into Glenn's work because it, it is probably, I guess, the best case study right now, Glenn, of how this can be used at scale. Let, let, me, let me talk for a moment about our own experience with this because I, I, we're kind of very interested in how to scale this up, and you might have a thought, Glenn. Just, just, just one thing to put yeah. in, Gary. Is, Please. Uh, we yeah, didn't talk about the pluralism or the compromise, but on those issues as well, we have just as clear sort of uses and and so like on all these elements we're really starting to see how how these things can both individually develop and and come together and as i said we're just at the start of all of it like you know these tools are very primitive but if we had anywhere near the focus i mean the funding that in total that's gone onto this is in the order of millions the the funding that goes into ai every year is in the order of tens of billions you know and 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 yet it's having these society-wide impacts. So like, there's just a huge case for us making the sort of social investments in this kind of stuff that we've made in AI technology. I 100% agree. You know, um, some years back now, it's more than a decade, we started building our own uh, collaborative problem-solving platform because I couldn't find anything out there that actually allowed you to bring thousands of people together to co-solve really difficult problems. And I'd seen, you know, the growth and development of, of uh, the open source community and uh, was pretty familiar on, on how that worked and how uh, bits of code could be forked, how it got integrated in, in, into the kernel and so on. But we, we were looking inside of organizations and, and, and what we found was there was no broadly participative approach for developing strategy, for helping you think about how the organization needs to evolve, what new capabilities do you need to build and so on. So we built something uh, called CrowdLab that we, we've now used in all kinds of uh, quite large organizations around the world where we're involving tens of thousands of people in, in, in these questions. Uh, and 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 recognizing that you know whether it's strategy or whether it's how your organization uh, uh, evolves, uh, how 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 you evolve the institution, what you need is a lot of ideas. You need a lot of peer review. You need a lot of experimentation. And and the pace at which any organization can evolve is kind of an arithmetic function of how many smart experiments are you running. But but here's what we found. So the platform I think works very well. In fact, I think it's the best one that that I know of in the world right now. The challenge that we find is CEOs, leaders, are very reluctant to ask the entire organization about their opinion on anything. And I think they understand reflexively that when you do that, you're giving up some control. You're no longer driving the conversation. They understand that when thousands or hundreds of people start to have a point of view on something and you do start to get that consensus and it does coalesce, you have to do something about it. You cannot say this is not important to us or, you know, we're simply not, not, not going to do it. And so... I think, you know, it's not like we need some AI, huge AI breakthrough to be able to use these platforms as Taiwan is using them, as we're using our little one. But, but you, do need, you do need to believe that, that we have to accelerate the pace of innovation here. And you do have to be willing to listen. You do have to be willing to, to, to give up a certain degree of control and invite, you know, and start this conversation. And that, at least for us, has often been the sticking point. 
I mean, I think it's very important that we bring in different types of social forces to making this work. So, for example, the ESG movement, you know, it's got that G at the end. G in for governance should not just be about like the guys aren't stealing money from the shareholders. It should be about are we really giving participatory engagement to the people in, in the organization? And by the way, I don't know if you guys know Colin Meyer, a guy you should definitely have on your show, wonderful person. Uh, business thinker, very influential, including on our CEO at Microsoft. He's a big believer in this. He really thinks that's what governance is about, you know? And he, he doesn't, he's not as focused on the sort of technology development and organizational structure as we are, but he really believes in it. So that that's absolutely, I, I think, uh, you know, one thing to leverage. Another thing to leverage is this focus on technology for democracy, which is increasingly coming out, you know, if it becomes that technology for democracy is just as much of a focus for societies as, uh, um, you know, AI innovation is, it'll become that your organization is not keeping up with the times if you're not participating in that, right? And, and then it will become a priority for those uh, CEOs. You know, we did, we did this interesting piece of research, Glenn, sorry to interrupt, but I just, I just want to build on that for a second. You know, some, some years ago, we got very into this question of why do some organizations, why have they enjoyed long periods of dominance? You know, take, take apart, you know, a real monopoly like Standard Oil or whatever, but why do they enjoy long periods of, of, of dominance? And when you go back and you look, what you find is that happened because of institutional innovation. Not, it was never the result of technology. It wasn't the result of a, of a, a new strategy, but it was, you know, it was, it was Toyota figuring out how do you, how do, you uh, uh, do distributed problem solving where you've trained, you know, tens of thousands of people to, to be able to solve complex problems. Or, 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 you know, it's, it was a company like Ford figuring out how do you manage huge amount of vertical integration and do that productively uh, and, and, and can run a larger, more complex operation than anybody in history had ever done so. And so if you look at history, this kind of organizational and institutional innovation, it was, it was important to why countries, you know, emerged stronger than others, but also why companies did. And yet, if you go into the typical uh, organization and you ask the CEO, like, well, what is your methodology? What is the strategy for organizational innovation, right? How many experiments are you running this year? Uh, why are you running those and not others? How do those emerge? They look at you like they can all tell you what they're doing with product innovation. They can tell you maybe what they're doing, you know, in R&D. But, but most like have nothing to say when you ask them, like, what is, what is your strategy for purposeful, fast, smart organizational innovation? Let me give you one illustration from Microsoft that I think is really uh, salient. I think many people have seen a cartoon showing what different organizations look like. And at Microsoft, you know, famously, there's like this thing of the different organizations shooting each other. Um, and, you know, that's gotten better under our great CEO, Sadia Nadella. But it's still a real challenge that, that we face. And my office, the office of the CTO, is to a significant extent charged with trying to facilitate those cross-group co collaborations. But if you think about that, that's fundamentally the same issue as public goods. So you think public goods, you know, whatever that, that I'm working on is some abstract problem. It, you know, for companies, it's absolutely critical. That notion of common infrastructure that may not be in the interest of any individual uh, group within the company to produce but that you know, you'd love to have a V-team bubble up and get the funding to provide it to everyone within the company. So uh, the, these, these que questions are just as relevant for companies as they are for governments and any, any community. They're also relevant for local governments. You, know, you think about public goods, that's how, that's really, if you read like the New Argonauts or, or a great business book like that, how local areas thrive. It's, it's the intercompany linkages that are created uh, by that social, those social relationships, right? So this has been super helpful. I would like to use to finish your, to walk us through your framework, right? So you talked about deliberation, you give us an example, but there are two other elements. Absolutely. So uh, let's talk about compromise. So how, in, in, when we're in small groups, we know that we're not going to get our way, even after we've deliberated and so forth all the time. We know we'll have to give up our, on certain elements of things or give up uh, on this occasion to get our way on other occasions where it's much more important to us. That's basically like a version of trade, but it's trade for a multilateral decision rather than a bilateral thing where I give up, you know, this, you know, in a bargain, we know that we always give up some things, we get other things, 
But when we're doing it with many, many people, how do we keep track of that? Money is not really a good currency uh, or standard money is not. And there's lots of economic theory to talk about that. So the question then is, if you wanted to use economic theory to make those multilateral decisions, how would you do it? And there's a procedure called quadratic voting, which is about doing exactly that. It's, it's uh, optimally derived from economic theory. You can be shown to be an optimal way to make a collective decision. And the basic concept behind it is that everyone has some uh, tokens that they can use to influence aspects of or a particular decision or choice of candidates. Um, but the more influence they have on any given issue, the more expensive it becomes to have more influence on that. So it's ex expensive to be extreme. And again, this is something that I think is familiar from small group deliberations. It's much easier to have a small influence on many things than it is to have a large influence on any one thing. Um, but you can't. Can, 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 can you give us an example in practice? Yeah. So uh, again, let's turn to Taiwan, actually a different thing in Taiwan. So this, this is called their presidential hackathon. They, uh, they use this as a way to identify promising innovations of the sort that we were describing for the government and to get them the attention that they need in order to get implemented at whatever the relevant agency or government level it is. And citizens participate in this. They receive a budget of tokens to allocate to the projects they consider most promising. Or if they think some projects are dangerous, they can actually vote those negative. Um, and uh, they can vote a little bit on a lot of projects, or they can concentrate on one project, but then it becomes increasingly expensive for them to do that. And uh, this system, then, they, they choose win basically winners based on this, who then receive sort of decreasingly uh, powerful representations of the president of the republic uh, giving her blessing that this is something that is viewed as legitimate and exciting and that she hopes the government, people within government will adopt. What, what, what would be an example of some of these issues they're voting on? So uh, these are actually not exactly issues. They're more like projects. So they would be, for example, uh, a, a new uh, way of distributing vaccines. Um, or a way of keeping track of environmental damage in the country uh, or penalizing polluters, for example. So rather than the horse trading or this debate taking place among bureaucrats, uh, you know, based on who can, you know, get the president's buy-in or who can, it sounds like they're, they're pushing basically that, I mean, it's not quite horse trading, but they're, this, this, this problem of prioritization, they're pushing it down to, to, to citizens. And by the way, it can also happen in legislatures because in many legislative caucuses um, are quite large to do that kind of horse trading in a very effective way. You actually end up even within the legislative caucus, just having a few leaders do everything. And in Colorado, the state legislative Democrats decided to use this mechanism to do precisely that prioritization for the discretionary budget three years in a row now. And in fact, it was so successful that it's now spreading throughout the executive agencies in Colorado. It's successful in what way, Glenn? Well, it makes everyone feel that they had a real influence on the prioritization, even if they didn't get their way on everything. Because you can choose to either spread things out and have a little bit of influence on many things, in which case you're likely to get your way on several of them, or you can focus on one issue, in which case you're likely to get your way on that one thing, but miss out on having any influence on the others. So it, it gives a way for everyone to participate and to have a to, to, for everyone to be winners, basically. You know, that's what compromise does is it allows everyone to be winners because they can win on the things that matter most to them. On that point, you could end up with people being a little bit satisfied, but with a suboptimal outcome for the collective, potentially. Right. So uh, it, it sounds, though, that this system allows you to get to decisions that are collectively kind of optimal as well. Well, there, there, there's, a, there's a theorem that says that now, and you could you know, show in laboratories that that works. Like knowing exactly what's collectively optimal in an organization is very hard to do. Like the subjective experience of people using a mechanism is gonna be much more determinative than is some like completely measurable set of outcomes. Um, I, I think you know, most technologies like this are measured by the degree to which people feel satisfied with them and, and they spread rather than, you know, some external criterion of optimality. 
Um, but, you know, there's also been laboratory experiments that do show that it performs very well uh, along those dimensions also. Let me ask a practical question, Glenn. I, not, I, I didn't know about quadratic voting, but years ago when I wrote The Future of Management, I argued that, you know, big strategic decisions in most organizations needed to be put kind of in this sense to, to a vote. Um, you know, let's let me pick it random. Let's let's say you're Intel and we're back in 2006 and they're going to pass on the decision to make chips for the iPhone. It seems to me that was the kind of question that you put to a lot of people in the organization. You say, that's one thing. You know, we're also going to do this acquisition of this company here. And we have this new fab that we want to build in country X or Y. And, you know, and, and you can present a certain amount of data around that and let people evaluate like, what should we be doing as a firm? But I guess the question is, and the same thing, you know, in Colorado or in Taiwan, how do you, you know, some of these decisions are, are you know, you're, you're making a bet, uh, not, not just, you know, on, on a project with, with the headline, right? Is how is that project going to be implemented? How are we going to keep score of, of whether it's working or not? I mean, it's, it's not about saying, yeah, let's get, let's give $2 billion to homelessness. It's like, well, how exactly are you going to tackle that problem? What metrics are you, are you going to use to know whether we're making progress or not? So how do, how do voters get the level, the depth of insight or perspective around this that allows them to make kind of an informed rather than just, you know, oh, yeah, that's, that, that sounds important to me. Well, I mean, that's the role of the deliberation prior to the compromise, right? Uh, deliberation is about information, coming up with better potential solutions, describing the space, shaping it, and compromise is about uh, action direction. Now, that doesn't mean that that one process is going to be the end of things and that it will prescribe everything or that it's an autonomous organization or whatever. It, it, there's going to be more levels of things, but you can still give, but that's true of any contract, right? I mean, well, can, can, can I just ask, in the case of, in the case of uh, Colorado, um, you know, what determines which, which priorities people get, get, you know, get put in front of them? You know, how, how, do, how do you, how does that slate emerge of here's what we can do with our discretionary budget? I don't know whether that's five well, things or 20 things or a hundred things. And then within each one of those things, how do you get a level of specificity around, well, exactly here's what we're intending to do if, 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 if you vote for that? Well, I think in, in Colorado, you know, there's, there's been a process for many, many years of, members being allowed to propose potential priorities for the discretionary budget. That has not changed. I think we could do better than that. I think we could use uh, some of the, these deliberation tools to do better than that. But that's not the experiment that we ran with them. We just ran the experiment holding fixed their current proposal methodology. How do they actually allocate the funds in the end, which I think is valid, but you know, we can do better. And, and in fact, Radical Exchange has a platform called Radical Exchange Voice, which integrates uh, these different aspects. So, so again, just last question, just trying to be as specific as I can. In, 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 in Colorado, when people are using their, their votes on these things, how, how much information do they have on these different priorities? Is, is, is it a sentence? Is it a paragraph? Is it a deep project? Or There's basically a, a draft piece of legislation for each one of them or like, you know, like a full, like okay. a, a, a proposal that's going to be funded if this passes. So you can go quite deep if you want to in, in terms of yeah. what, what you're actually, okay. And Glenn, sorry, on the presidential hackathon, so there people are instead not voting on sort of how to allocate the budgets, but rather on projects that they think ought to, ought to go forward, right? And they're just expressing their interest in which ones need to do that. And, and it sounds like, can you get to maybe say a little bit more about the level of context people have around those projects? I mean, is that, again, uh, There's uh, a part demo. of what it's happens like, in the deliberation? Like a pitch. Think of it as like a hackathon. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a hackathon... When, when they choose the winners of a hackathon, each one gives a demo or a presentation about their project. And, and it's similar here. Okay. And how many people uh, in this presidential hackathon um, get to, are engaged in, in, in voting? Um, so is it, is it, I mean, if you think about this as a second stage after, after deliberation, is there like a drop off where you only have certain people who are really hardcore and when I get into the weeds? I, th I think it was like a few hundred thousand. Okay. Can you envision, because you mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, companies have, in, 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 you know, public goods that are internal, that is, that are investments that they can make that benefit multiple divisions. And so if you allocate funding 
at the level of each division or business unit or whatever, you are going to get um, into suboptimal outcomes because no one really wants to invest for everybody else. Can you envision having this kind of approach, whether it's quadratic voting? I mean, we talked a little bit about deliberation, but the quadratic voting... Sure, sure. Take the example of the presidential hackathon. I mean, I think this parallels things that go on in companies all the time. Like, much, if not most, of what my, you know, uh, our CEO does is that people present various things to him and he sort of has differing degrees of enthusiasm for what they present. They're kind of like ideas about something that the company needs. And he doesn't ever order anyone really to like go off and do that. I mean, very, very rarely he does. Usually what he does is he expresses sort of different degrees of enthusiasm. And then people use that enthusiasm to try to get support in their command chain or try to, you know, get the CFO to allocate funds or something like that. That's really what this process is. It's just that rather than it being the CEO sitting there, it's some process by which the whole company brings its collective wisdom to bear on what things deserve that signal of enthusiasm, you know? That is certainly our model. I mean, you know, the ability, if, if you think e even, let's assume you have really smart people running a company. I think that's usually the case. But, but if you think of the amount of intelligence and wisdom that has to be brought to bear to make these big decisions on whether we invest, you know, X, Y, or Z, there's no small group of people that commands that amount of knowledge. It's just like impossible. And, you know, what, what we see again and again and again in organizations is you have a group of people at the top who have a big emotional, a lot of emotional equity in the past, uh, who have been set up as like, you know, judge, jury, and executioner of every new proposal, new idea. And they like systematically overinvest in what is at the expense of what could be. Uh, you know, we've argued for years that that you know, in 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 making any critical decision organizations, you need to overrepresent the people at the fringe, the people that are a long way from head office, the the, the the relative new hires, people who've worked in other industries. But but you know, the concentration of decision making power is fundamentally toxic to the evolutionary capacity of an organization and the likelihood you're going to see the future and bet on the right thing. So at least what you're describing for us is like, this is not a nice to have. I mean, to the extent we hang on to those more centralized decision-making structures, as, as we've seen again and again and again, the incumbents are going to miss the future. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I, think, uh, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Um, we need good ways to do it. And I think that the, these offer them. So should I, should I turn to the last one about pluralism? So, so pluralism is about the notion that even though we need to come together and make these joint decisions, we still need to modularize. We can't make, do everything as a whole. Um, and so we have to recognize that there are going to be these different groups. And it's not just individuals, right? Like the market and standard de democratic vision is like there's, there's just individuals and then there's the collective. But pluralism recognizes, no, there's many different organizations, both hierarchically and intersecting, uh, related to each other. And um, we need to recognize those organizations in making decisions. We need to recognize them in the way that we organize. So quadratic voting doesn't do this. Quadratic voting, every individual gets these points, right? Um, but but actually, as, as Gary is pointing out, and, and McKelly was highlighting, it's not just individuals organizations have to be important here. I mean, like in many circumstances, you might want to have some points given to each one of several organizations, but then one organization is bigger than another organization. So should it have more? Like those are the questions that are critically important. It's like, how do we think about social difference? What we actually want to do is create cooperation across social difference, not across individuals. And um, having systems that actually explicitly take in that into account both as a way to delegate to the organizations the things that are within their purview so that they really do get authority over those things and those, not just the formal organizations but there could be v teams there could be anything any group that is the set of relevant experts should have the relevant decisions decentralized to them in a dynamic way and at the same time when we make decisions that cut across those groups we need to seek consensus across different perspectives, different social groups, and not just like even a quadratically weighted support from different individuals. And um, social networks are an incredibly powerful potential substrate for us to do that because they 
track social difference in a dynamic rather than a static way, not just some org structure, but like what's the, what's the on the ground reality of people's relation to each other? I'm not sure I'm tracking. Um, are, are you talking about how do you decide where individual units, let's say in a large organization, uh, uh, have autonomy and can act without collaboration or without, you know, I, what, what's, what's the problem this, 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 this you're trying to solve here? Well, I, I think there's two elements. One, one is what you're saying is like, how do you modularize? How do you give the authority to go forward to smaller groups, but not just smaller groups that are like 10 years ago, we set up these organizations and whatever, but like a any emergent smaller group, right? That may have emerged since you last redid the org structure. And, and second, and relatedly, how, when you have to make decisions that cut across those groups, do you consider like who's the voting population, right? You know, like in quadratic voting, we just had a bunch of individuals, but like, as I pointed out, that's not even really the right way to think about social difference. Like it might be that you want each organization to vote, but then organizations are of different size. So you don't just want each organization, like you have to actually think about that whole set of social relations when you think about what, what, what are the set of entities that are participating in this process? And, 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 it's, and there's not just one set of organizations, right? Because there's all those intersecting V teams. And, and, and once you think about all of that social complexity, you need, you need a, like a, a, a whole different way of conceptualizing both these deliberative and compromise type processes to account for all these different dimensions of social difference. Like if you want to take the Colorado example, right? Well, they just did it with the members of the Democratic caucus. But what if you had the Democrats and the Republicans? And within the Democratic caucus, you probably have the Black caucus, and maybe there's some Republicans that are part of the Black caucus. And like, how do you want to keep track of all that stuff when you think about like, what are the sources of, you know, this quadratic thing and whatever that you actually want to take into account? Yeah, unpack that a little bit more practically because. Do, do do you see a place where where somebody's come up with a solution here that 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 you can balance the interests of the individual and the collective that you can you know manage appropriately the decision rights among groups with I mean let let me give you a practical example in most large companies you have big established divisions that represent 80 90 percent of existing revenues the 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 executive vice presidents who run those things t typically been in the company for 20 year 20 years they're very powerful they have the ear of the CEO they can always go and win their case. They negotiate very well. And, and people with new ideas or are more junior or whatever have a very hard time getting heard. And so you have extraordinarily unequal, you have all these power asymmetries that, that have nothing to do with the quality of the underlying idea. It's just, you know, it's, it's sheer size or political influence. So are, are there ways of, of balancing that out in, in kind of smart ways, or am I am I mischaracterizing the, the, the problem here under under this 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 challenge of, of managing the plurality? So, uh, like an example I would give is think about the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution is not a simple democracy. A lot of people complain about this. I actually think it's it's part of its genius, but it's um, it, it's instead meant to over represent small entities within the conceptual framework of the United States. Um, you know, small states get overrepresented. And um, in, in uh, Lebanon, they have a similar system, but for religions, small religions get overrepresented because there's a history of religious violence there and they want to avoid uh, conflict between those religions. That may not be the best advertisement, but uh, keep going. <laughs> well, 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 yeah, but, but so, so, yeah, so the, the, those systems, are very prevalent, I think are very important, and yet also we have a lot of reasons to be skeptical of them, right? Um, because they don't really keep up with the times, right? The states are no longer the main divisions. Now our main divisions are ethno-racial, they're political parties, they're rural versus urban, et cetera. And so what you'd really like to do in some ways is like have federalism to the African-American community. So that if there was like a murder within the African-American community, it should be African-American police, African-American, you know, within from that community, judges, jury, they should be judging that. I mean, do they want to be, do they want to defund the, whatever they should choose? It's a, it doesn't really affect anyone else. I mean, I'm not saying that every murder is that way, but, but, but really it's something happening within that community in the same way that, you know, states manage the murders within those communities, right? Unless it's an interstate murder. 
So like you'd want to be able to delegate to those things. But the thing is, we don't have a dynamic way of tracking those lines of difference. Our ways of tracking lines of difference are extremely static. They're stuck in the past. And conversely, it's not just that notion, what I would call subsidiarity or delegation. It's also the issue of finding consensus. So like, you know, the Senate overweights those small units, but does it, but it doesn't overweight African-Americans in the same way, or it doesn't overweight like, you know, small religious groups or like there, there should be some way to keep track of when there's a marginalized social group, just as you were referring to Gary and overhear the voice of that marginalized social group, because those marginalized social groups are the ones that are not going to be as homogeneous as the other ones and therefore are going to bring those different perspectives that need to be heard in the process of decision making. And Glenn, is there is there um, a mechanism of sorts that helps you? I mean, is this still like a conceptual idea or is there something that you know allows you to find the right locus of uh, localization, which is not just not just as you say about geographic or it's about, you know, finding the right kind of uh, um, uh, you know, dimension of intersectionality, I guess, that, to bring to bear, right? Um, well, I, I, we, haven't, we haven't figured out all the mechanics of it. We're working on it and we're actually trying to start, uh, we should include you guys actually, but we're trying to start really a new field of academic research that will be around trying to build these types of mechanisms. But I think that social graphs give us a powerful tool to use in thinking about this because they make the notion of social distance much more precise and much more dynamic and flexible, right? There's all kinds of operations you could apply to social graphs to think about, is, are these people from a different or a very similar perspective, right? And um, in fact, those, they've been used for that purpose uh, in science studies. There's a wonderful set of work that I really recommend to you guys, you should check out by James Evans, where they use the graph of co-publications um, in science to f understand the social dynamics and to prove that most innovation comes from bridging previously non-communicating scientific communities rather than either from isolated genius or from the existing organizations, right? Um, and so that harnessing that power of um, surprising connection, I think is the key uh, to organizational performance, to scientific performance, to uh, economic performance. And that's the sort of thing that we need and, and as well as to solving problems of social justice, as we were talking about in politics. Yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly this challenge of how do you hear the underrepresented voices? I mean, that is something that, you know, is absolutely crucial and, and probably we're not very, you know, we're not very good at that. Uh, but also, how do you link, uh, you know, disconnected constituencies where there's a chance to learn and a chance uh, to 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 uh, solve problems in new ways. I mean, it's interesting. You know, more generally, if if you look at the people who often create breakthroughs in science, often they they come from adjacent fields or other fields, right? They're not people who spent thirty years in that field. So, I think you know what what you tend to find in a lot of organizations is the conversations over time is the same people talking about the same people around the same issue, uh, and and there's not a lot of connectivity, and pretty soon you have an echo chamber. So if, if that's part of the problem you guys are working on, that seems to me like, like super, super critical. Yeah, so those three elements, deliberation, compromise, and pluralism, to me are the core of what makes for functional small groups. But you know, just as we pointed out with the pluralism, the incredible opportunity that we have with large groups is there's gonna be so much more pluralism. There's all that greater potential energy but we haven't figured out how to harness it in a way that, that addresses these problems. And, and, and that to me is sort of the essence of what social innovation can, can empower. So Glenn, can I come back though to something you mentioned earlier? Because I, it seems to me, and you'll correct me, but I think there's something that precedes the kind of deliberation. You first have to have some really interesting options to look at before I can deliberate on them. And what certainly we see in organizations, as I mentioned earlier, there's very little organizational innovation going on. People generally, you know, they're not looking at a really interesting portfolio of new ways that we can use to set priorities, allocate resources, onboard new employees, you know, do compensation. And, and a lot of what we do with our management hackathons, and this is, this is literally true, we, you know, we, we'll first educate people on what does it mean to innovate around the organization. We give them a new set of principles to do that. 
But in a large company, we're generating thousands, and I mean thousands, of ideas on how we change all those things, right? If we want to be more open, if we want more meritocracy, if we want more transparency, if we want, you know, whatever, how, you know, what is your idea about how we might change all of the ways we run our organization? And so for us always, the first step is, how do you generate a really robust portfolio of options and then you can have the deliberation because most people are stuck in a pretty orthodox view. They they just assume that a company the size of Microsoft needs eight levels, right? They've never seen one that has three levels or zero levels. They just assume that a small group of leaders at the top should set strategy or make the big resource allocation decisions. They just assume that your boss is in charge of your career or has the biggest voice in doing performance review. And, 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 and our experience is like, first, you have to really quite intentionally uh, um, uh, turn upside down. So you have to reveal and turn upside down all those taken for granted assumptions that we just inherited from the past. This is the way it works. And we, we like, you know, don't even think that way. And then you have to be quite intentional about creating a, a really robust portfolio of alternatives. Uh, and then you can start to deliberate on them and then you can turn them into experiments. And then, but I think, you know, most organizations, I mean, most struggle with this even in products and technology. They, they don't have a very robust, you know, a very large population of new strategic options and alternatives. Certainly when it comes to innovating around the organization, they have, in my experience, like very few have any process that generates a really interesting and rich array of alternatives to the status quo. But see, to me, that's exactly what the pluralism element of this is about. It's about the deliberate fostering of sub-communities which are novel and create bridges between existing communities. Because if you just have bridges within the communities, you just reproduce the same set of ideas, right? Like a new community is going to be a V team formed around some, some thing that they can't find in their existing organization. And you need an incentive structure that not from the top down, but, but provides the incentives for a bottom up formation of those new types of configurations. You know, in, in the standard capitalist world, we call this entrepreneurship ecosystem. But the reality is entrepreneurship d doesn't get even close to the power that you can have when you deliberately bring different sorts of people together, rather than just say, oh, there's this pot of money that can pursue, you make some money in the market. You actually like have something that deliberately fosters th those connections. You have the potential to just get much more generative things. You know, you, you gave the example of innovators coming from the margins. Uh, one great example of this is that um, the germ theory uh, was invented hundreds of years before it was actually applied. It was discussed, but it wasn't really used in a practical way to address um, like the, the problem until you, there was a person who was, I think, a surgeon, a like, you know, uh, a physician and a um, like a someone who knew how to use a microscope all at the same time. And, and those were completely separate professions. They had no relationship to each other. And the notion that there was some integrated concept of biology was just like, that, that wasn't in, in the imaginary. They were, these were different professions. This person happened to like, his father was a surgeon and his, you know, uh, uh, he was trained in another field, whatever. And, and so he just happened to be at the intersection of these things that created lightning. You know what I mean? And, um, that is what we need to be fostering the possibility of in a in a deliberate way using these types of mechanisms. Yeah, that 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 is for sure. I think I think the chances of getting a true breakthrough is very much a function of you know the the variety of perspectives you're bringing to bear on on the problem, and uh, the, you know that's why what, when we do this work in organizations. You know, we're we're never talking to one group. We want the we want the IT people there. We want the people out of HR there. We want the operators there because we want the front line there. Because the chance that any particular function part of the organization sees a new solution is 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 pretty remote. It's when you bring all these different uh, viewpoints uh, together. You know, which is kind of sad because you know we have all these conversations right now about diversity. But if you look at most organizations, they're not very good at bringing really a lot of diverse voices together around complex problems. Exactly. Yeah, and, and I think that um, doing that in a, in a scalable, deliberate um, way that harnesses the new technologies, like that's what social networks were made for. Social networks have been used to 
get people more and more entrenched in their position so that you can extract from them commercially. But social networks are really meant to do the opposite. You know, the, the current social media environment is what I would call anti-social media. It's about reducing people's social connections or tightening them inward to, to take advantage of how that engages them. But what is possible with social networks is instead actually seeing those lines of difference and seeing them as the potential energy that becomes possible when we understand how people think differently. Well, and you know, in the business uh, world, uh, Glenn, I mean, the, the whole idea of social networking and social network analysis has been around for, uh, for a while. I think it's becoming a little bit more prominent nowadays, but the way it's actually though being implemented and pursued is through in, in a very kind of instrumental way so that you know that is we want to find who the real influencers are in the organization who really are the thought leaders so we can kind of co-opt them and so that they can then advance our agenda right uh, as opposed to saying let's let's just amplify their voice let's empower them let 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 them be the drivers of, of change so you know, again, it's it's one of those things where you have the technology, but if, if you're using the technology to to kind of perpetuate the status quo, you know, you're not going to get very far. So it does require that kind of reset in terms of, you know, what are you trying to achieve uh, through the technology? So, Glenn, can I ask you a, a, a question? So, you know, you're let, let's just back away for a moment. So, so your argument is, you know, we need to pick up the pace of social and institutional innovation. We heartily agree. We wrote, we wrote a book about that. So did you. Um, you know, you would say that right now we are not very systematic about that. We're not very thoughtful about that as a society. Yes, social change happens, you know, like with social media, but, you know, we're not really being thoughtful about why and how and so on. So what are you saying to your colleagues at Microsoft about this, right? If, if, if you're talking to your boss, the chief uh, technology officer at Microsoft, if he's talking to the CEO, what, what does Microsoft need to do? And or what are other organizations? Now, we, well, maybe we can end on the, on the highest societal level, but just within an organization that's responsible for, you know, keeping pace in this crazy world, what, you know, how are you telling them to become more thoughtful and more experimental about how they run your own company? It's funny, Gary, because I, I have a lot of different potential things I could speak to at Microsoft, and I've ended up not speaking as much to the internal organizational things, even though I talk a little bit about it. I end up speaking more to the intersection with the broader politics. So I, I've definitely told people about these ideas and there's interest and even enthusiasm for them, but I haven't had sort of the concerted way of trying to bring about change there that would really be required. Um, I think, you know, folks like you would focus more attention on doing that. I, I focus more on the intersection with the broader pol political environment. So, so if, if we take the broader environment, there's plenty of reasons to be a little bit... Um you know, a little bit pessimistic right now um, uh, about how we're, you know, handling all this. As you were saying earlier, even, you know, as we think about a plural society, even the ways we divide ourselves up and think about ourselves has been changing radically way faster than our political parties can kind of reorient around that. And new kinds of fault lines are opening up all the time. Uh, and, 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 and we know that trust in large institutions of all kinds is at an all-time low so how do you think about solving it at the society level then? Well, I think that the most promising uh, routes involve a plurality of ways of getting there. So I, I think you have to, if you want bottom-up innovation, have cultural artifacts that inspire people to do things from the bottom up. You need to have technological structures that give them the possibility of experimenting with things. You need to have academic research that breaks open their way of thinking about things and forces them to confront ideas that are bolder and also that are sort of optimized um, in, in, to, to achieve those other types of goals. So I, I believe in operating on all of these fronts. But to, to really get the sort of catalysis of social focus around this, I think the most compelling route is actually the story of Taiwan. I think the story of Taiwan is is extremely compelling for this moment in uh, the political systems of liberal democracies because it appeals to people who are on the right. They're on the front lines against China. It appeals to people on the left because, you know, she's the first uh, 
transgender minister of a major government in the world. Um, it speaks to markets and democracy, to decentralization, um, and to solidarity all at the same time. And she's just an incredibly compelling person. So I, I believe very strongly in working with and, and the narrative of that story as a way to catalyze uh, the sort of common focus on this that we need. And Glenn, so uh, where can people find out more about the Taiwan story? Do you have any? Yeah, there's a great uh, Wired piece uh, called How Taiwan's Unlikely uh, minister, uh, Digital Minister Hacked the Pandemic. Um, and there's uh, a deeper piece on the Radical Exchange website called Taiwan's Digital Democracy. Um, both of those are really good entry points. But Audrey also has infinite podcasts and, uh, you know, she and I are working on a book. So hopefully that will be an even deeper exposition of some of these issues. And, uh, you know, hopefully many more things as well. We can put some of those links uh, uh, in, in, in below and people can, uh, can go deeper. Glenn, I, you know, you've been super generous with your time. Just one last question, if I could. And it's just triggered by what you said about uh, referencing the pandemic. So if there's been one uh, test of institutional competence, it has been this. And it seems to me a lot of institutions failed and failed miserably. So do you, do you have a sense as to whether this actually, um, you know, will teach people the right lessons and this will be a spur <laughs> to institutional reform? Or, or do you see things especially, you know, getting normalized back to the sclerotic uh, mediocrity that we had prior, prior to, to COVID-19? I think there's a reckoning coming, but whether it goes one direction or the other is a question. I think that the China model had some real successes. And I think there's a real attraction there, especially for a lot of the developing world. And I think the Taiwan model had many more and much greater successes. Uh, it's less known and less known partly deliberately because of uh, who doesn't want you to know about it. Um, but I think it's a much more promising one. And I hope that's the lesson that we take instead. OK, so so more pluralism, more digital democracy, right? And uh, more more con con concerted action, which I think are great lessons, not only for, uh, you know, institutional innovation at the society level, but within our organizations as well. And maybe we close it there, uh, Glenn, uh, after this like marathon discussion with you, we're so grateful that uh, you shared all these amazing perspectives. And, you know, we will keep uh, following your progress at Social Exchange and beyond, right? Because we, yeah. we need more of these ideas and and more applications of them. So thanks again Look, so much. Looking forward for... to working with both of you guys on it. All Thank right. you. Take Thank care. you, Glenn. Bye.